Episode 281 Save a Dowry for Mommy The boy directed the man's attention to the TV screen, which was flashing motion pictures of the latter in James's teen movie titled Bamboo Dragonfly. Martin stared blankly at the screen for a while, for an upward hook tugged at the corner of his lips. He had seen a similar-looking child once, and that was the young boy of the Lewis family. He supposed that this child was one of the twins and Monica's son. He was a very witty child. Calling back his thoughts, a grin blossomed on his face. What a cute child. What's your name? Andres Thames. The little boy politely arranged his hands to his back. His eyes then anxiously darted on to his mother, who was in the man's grasp. Puzzled by this, he inquired, What happened to mommy? She drank. The little boy's lips convulsed, feeling rather irritated. She drank again. Dumb mommy. She's aware of her poor alcohol tolerance, yet she still went ahead and drank. Martin carried her all the way to the bedroom to put her down. When the man exited the room, he was approached by Andres, whose hand was now holding an autograph notebook. With a sweet and elegant smile on his lips, he looked just like a handsome young gentleman. Uncle Martin, could you please give me your autograph? <laughs> I'm a big fan of yours. The man slowly crouched before him, lightly poking at his straight nose bridge. He teased, You're a fan, huh? Do you know how to sing my songs? I do. But Andres is tone deaf and sounds horrible. The man could not help but be amused by his bashful countenance. What a little cutie. All right, I'll sign for you. He pulled up a smile as he took the pen from the little boy. He then penned a signature elegantly on the notebook. Thank you, Uncle Martin. The young lad inclined his head and asked, with sparkling black orbs, Uncle Martin, are you filming a movie with my mommy now? Yes. I'm your mommy's colleague. My mommy's really dumb, so Uncle Martin must take care of her. If she's being bullied in the team, Andres will be very upset. The young boy clasped at his heart pitifully and wore an anxious look. Martin was secretly in shock. This kid was truly different from others. Other children his age were still immature despite being fluent with their speeches. This child, meanwhile, was no ordinary kid. He radiated wit and easily charmed people with his choice of words. What was more precious was that he loved his mommy dearly. He was a sensible and lovely child. He nodded in assurance. Andres, don't worry. I will take good care of your mommy and not let anyone bully her. Really? Really. It's a promise, then. Andres stretched his little finger out, and the man quickly locked it with his to make a pinky promise. Why did mommy return home so late this night? The young boy indirectly probed. The man's face was ridden with guilt. Um, we had a dinner gathering, so she came back a little late. The little boy heaved a sigh of relief upon knowing the reason for her delayed return. Had a dinner gathering? That was why she had arrived home late and her phone was turned off. Calls could not go through to her no matter what, and that made him worry about her a lot. Once the superstar departed, Andres dashed into the washroom and brought out a hot towel. As he entered the bedroom, he was startled to find his mommy wide awake in bed. Mommy? You're not drunk? Her face looked wan and lifeless when she looked at him. A little taken aback, he hurried over to his mother's side and tucked her face with his two hands. Mommy, you look bad. What happened? Did anyone bully you? No one. Mommy is lying. Her son looked at her angrily. Someone must have bullied you. Mommy, tell Andres who it is, and I'll take revenge for you. She forced out a smile and opened her arms to him, saying in a broken voice, Andres, come over here and give Mommy a hug. He looked at her face and saw that her fragile self was on the verge of collapsing. Instantly, his heart ached nearly to the point of suffocation. He immediately climbed into her embrace. She buried her petite face in the crook of his neck as she hugged his warm and pliant body more tightly. Somehow, her frigid heart regained some heat from his warmth. Andres, who was burrowing deep into her arms, knew that she was depressed by not seeing her face. 
The mother and son were connected in this way. His little hand caressed her cheek as he muttered softly, Mommy, if you aren't happy, Andres won't be happy too. Andres is sad when you are sad. Tell Andres who bullied you, and I'll punish that person for you. No one, no one bullied Mommy. Andres, you're so negative. Mommy's just feeling tired. Sniffing the after-shower freshness on his body as she held him tightly, the turmoil inside her eased somewhat. Andre smells so nice. Mommy, you're so bad. Why are you back late? Andre's waited long for your return. Stupid mommy. You shouldn't drink when you can't hold your liquor. Didn't you promise Andre's not to drink again? The boy grumbled about this while looking up at her. I'm innocent. Mommy didn't drink tonight. I only took a sip symbolically. I'm not drunk at all. She defended herself and even puffed a breath for him to check. The boy snuffled at her lips, and true enough, he could not sniff any strong alcohol smell. That was when he believed her. Good mommy. You're forbidden from drinking even a drop of alcohol in the future. Understood, boss Andres. She reached out with both hands to hold his face close to hers and affectionately rubbed her nose with his. Andres, Mommy wants to be with you her entire life. When I'm old, will you desert me? No, Mommy won't grow old, her son retorted sweetly. When Mommy grows old, will Andres despise me? Even if I do despise you, it will just be a bit. He pointed to the tip of his thumb for emphasis. She looked at him with a mournful face. Mommy... You should be satisfied. Andres won't desert you even when you become old, infirm, and stupid. Even if there's despise, it's just a teeny-weeny bit. Andres loves Mommy the most. His honest declaration of love tickled her, and she burst into a sincere laughter. All right, Mommy. Quickly go wash up and then head to bed. You still have work tomorrow morning. She made a sign of surrender. Okay, boss Andres. Mommy promises to work hard and earns money for your marriage. Andres' mouth twitched at its corners. Inwardly, he was thinking, who needs you to earn spare change? The dowry I've prepared for you is so much more. If she knew how much her son had secretly set aside for her dowry, she would be too astounded for good. Episode 282, Blacklist Him The next day, Monica officially joined the production team. The boot ceremony had become the next morning's headline on several tabloids. The upcoming movie quickly became a hot topic, with its exceptional cast, top production team, and two main leads as ambiguous relationships. A few newspapers published photos taken during the ceremony of the two leads. With the pairing of striking Martin and the stunning Monica, the pictures quickly became the new crowd favorite. The Green Apple, via media publicity, became the much-anticipated movie of the year. At the same time, the film's photo shoots were released on Foxconn's official website. This film's pictures, compared to other movies, were done very professionally, but no one could match them. Whereas other movies' photo shoots tended to be sloppily done, this film's photo shoots, whether the raw shots or the edited ones, were executed to perfection. Once they were released, they easily attracted the attention of the novel's large fan base. It even rose to become the hottest topic on Instagram. Even the novelist praised the production on Instagram and expressed her high expectation for the movie. In the beginning, a majority of the Superstars fans populated the message board on the movie's official website, Slam Monica. This was simply because she was the chosen female lead this time. In the past, almost every female lead he was paired with suffered the same sort of attack from his fans. Soon, photo shoots attracted the faithful fans of the novel. Whenever a novel was adapted into a movie or a TV series, fans of the original work would have their say. It was easy for the readers to immerse themselves in a novel. However, once it was adapted into a TV series or a movie, many factors could bring disappointments to fans, and some of which were poor acting skills 
inappropriate selection of cast, or poor screen adaptation. Fans of the original work were hard to please. James, on the other hand, was known for his meticulousness and his attentiveness to every piece of detail in a show he was directing. A few fans of the novel expressed their concerns over Martin being chosen for the main lead role when the cast were first announced. In the novel, the character Nathan Stark transitioned from being a teenager to a young adult. Since Martin was already 28, the novel's fans felt that he was too old for the role. Their fears pierced at once the moment his photo shoots came out, though. This was because he had the look, indubitably. He also looked unbelievably young. While he had been in the show business for over a decade, he did not seem to age for even a day after he had made his debut at the age of 18. The only difference was that his naivety was long replaced by a mature and kingly disposition. Monica's photo shoots equally attracted much praise and attention. The original novel, The Forbidden Love, had millions of fan base. Many fans were initially worried over a newcomer being cast for the novel's film adaptation. It was difficult to replicate the charisma of Diana Stark. Good acting skills might move the character portrayal along, but charisma was something an average actress did not possess. During the film's open audition for the female lead, the novel's fans once had a poll for their most preferred actress to portray the role. Being the most popular young actress at present, Claire expectedly had the highest vote. Still, many cried foul following this poll. Fans deemed the actress to be too worldly and old to portray the innocent and pure protagonist properly. None of that schoolgirl's naivety could be found in her. On the contrary, when Monica's photo shoots were released, the fans went wild in an instant. This was clearly the character herself in the show. She fit the character in the novel so much, it was as if Diana Stark had walked out of the book itself. Many fans of the novel The Forbidden Love openly discussed the newcomer on Instagram, some of them even asking for her name. Meanwhile, others expressed their high expectations for the upcoming movie. The film's desirability had significantly risen. Quite a number of people showed support for the director and praised the hard-working production team for their stringent standards in role selection. They believed that the film would be a classic. For select individuals, they made their desire for the director to stick to the original work as close as possible known. Inside the production set, Isabel, Monica's assistant, opened Instagram on her phone. Within a few days, the verified account she got from Monica gained a following of two million. Two million fans within a few days. Oh God, this was nothing short of a miracle. One must know that this was an incredible feat for a rookie. This meant that her popularity was on the rise by the day. It appeared that everyone had high expectations for her. The female lead was finished with her makeup and came up to her assistant. Seeing her busily fiddling with her phone, she thought that the former was watching an interesting video clip. Upon closer look, however, she realized that her assistant was reading the fans' messages on Instagram. What are you doing? Monica whispered to her ear. The assistant jumped with a start and patted her chest in relief when she saw that it was only her. My gosh, you scared me. Monica, you're finally here. Wow. Isabel widened her eyes at her actress in awe. Oh, God, Monica. You look so gorgeous in your makeup. She was in a high school uniform, a white short sleeve shirt, and a navy blue pleated skirt, which showed off her pair of long, slender, and fair legs. Her face wore nude makeup to project the image of a high school student. There were hardly any traces of cosmetics on her face. In fact, despite wearing a thick layer of foundation, she appeared not to be wearing any makeup at all. Stylus lightly lined her eye rims, which accentuated her orbs further. Her lashes were long and pretty. With the addition of her pink lips, white teeth, and rosy cheeks, she was freshly elegant and captivatingly beautiful at the same time. She was really tickled by her assistant's reaction. What do you mean? Are you trying to say that I look plain without makeup? Of course not. I'm just saying that you look even better without makeup on. Oh, Monica. I've decided that from now on, 
You will be my goddess. Her assistant was totally conquered by her beauty. I oh. She probed curiously. Who used to be your goddess then? Grace Wills. Oh, the assistant replied with her eyes blinking. Grace Wills? She tried to conjure the image of the said actress in her mind. Are you really into showbiz? She's the actress who shot to fame in Rose Knight. She's been around for three years now. With her superstar status, she's currently worth millions. Her voice was full of admiration. Monica, work hard, eh? I see potential in you. Do well in this show, and you'll be famous. Just then, her phone rang without warning. Monica took out her phone. and She saw the name flickering on the screen. The expression on her face changed abruptly, and she cut it off sans a second thought. Who called? Her assistant asked, only to hear the phone ring again. Her artiste cut it off without looking this time. The assistant was stunned. Monica, why don't you accept the call? Don't plan to do so. Face had turned frosty for an unknown reason. Phone rang again stubbornly. After she cut off the call again, she put the number on her block list. Her assistant was too astonished for words usually happens when a couple of quarrels, right? Does she have a boyfriend? Episode 283 Book the Tickets and Return At a Presidential Suite Stefan listened to the busy tone repeatedly play on his phone as he lay on a sofa. He made three consecutive calls, and all of them were rejected. He was already filled with pent-up rage. As for the fourth call he made, it unexpectedly failed to get through. The fifth call. The sixth call. Every time he placed a call, he would hear a voicemail greeting, which was promptly followed by the disconnect tone. With his hand features hardening... He stared fixedly at his phone screen and spoke in a solemn tone full of vexation. What's going on? Is your phone dead? Harry Miller, Stefan's driver, carefully observed his expression and contemplated for a bit before he offered an explanation. Um, but usually in this situation it means that your number has been blacklisted. Blacklisted? What does blacklisted mean? He raised his side onto him. The tone of his voice was already hinting at danger. His subordinate peered at his complexion, which was as frosty as the temperature inside a house made of ice, and cautiously worded his explanation. There's a call block list on every phone. Normally, if someone places a number on this block list, the owner of that number can't call that person again. As the very same suggests, getting blacklisted means that you're added on her call block list, and you can no longer get through to her number. Bang! The crystalline glass on the table was smashed into pieces, causing droplets of water to splatter about. Blacklisted? The woman dared to blacklist me? My phone's wrecked. Give me yours. Stefan tossed his phone to the table with a resounding clang and demanded his subordinate to hand over his. Receiving the phone, he then furiously entered her number and pressed dial. The call actually went through. The anger on his face was further overcast. Harry Miller, who was filled with consternation at the side, trembled as he held his breath in fear. He was quite worried for the safety of the phone. A series of ringing ensued before the call was picked up and Monica's polite greeting was heard. Hello? Foolish woman. Why didn't you answer my call? The man thundered, feeling greatly displeased. He finally accepted the fact that his number had been blacklisted by her. How dare this woman blacklist my number? Woman, what is wrong with you? Did you blacklist my number? After a prolonged silence, she gave a very casual answer. Yes, I've blacklisted it. The man's assistant held his breath for her. Gosh, this Monica is bold beyond belief. She even dared to provoke the chairman? As he had expected, darkness instantly loomed over the man's face. He suddenly got up on his feet and landed a kick to the table. An exquisite antique vase on the tabletop fell to the floor and shattered as a corollary. Woman, provide me with a reasonable explanation. He growled, clenching his subordinate's phone with much strength and screen almost cracked. 
explain? Why should I explain anything to you? I'm busy. I'm hanging up. As soon as she ended her sentence, she hung up the phone without waiting for his retort. Damn it. He dialed the number again while simmering in rage. Instead, he received a message saying that his call could not get through. Clearly, his subordinate's number was mercilessly blacklisted as well. An ominous and dark mass emerged on his face, and a wave of fury surged within his eyes. His number was blacklisted, yet he could not vent his pent-up rage. What an unpleasant feeling it was. With a loud thud, he sent the phone smashing to the ground. A shiver ran down Harry's spine. Glancing at his phone, he could imagine his heart bleeding. Boss, please simmer down. A woman is always a little willful. They have to be properly handled. He promptly approached Superior and did his best to calm the man down. Get out! He reinforced his fist with all the frustrations he had inside him and sent it flying towards his subordinate's shoulder. The latter's arm was nearly dislocated by the brutal punch. Harry promptly excused himself to the side while he cradled his injured shoulder. He ignored the immense pain radiating from it and remained standing perfectly still as he surveyed the livid man for him with trepidation. From what he could remember, his boss seldom lost his temper. Having a greater self-restraint than so many others, everything seemed to be under his control, and there was no exception to that. Monica, however, appeared to be one. Only that woman was outside of his superior's control. Balling up his hands into fists, the man emanated a chillingly terrifying aura one could feel it in his bones. The pressure from his aura was so grim and overwhelming, it seemed capable of suffocating anyone. Harry peered at the sharp look in the man's eyes, and suddenly found it difficult to breathe. The man before him was indubitably a terrifying man. He could truly make others fear him from the bottom of their hearts. Find her location. Receiving his order, he speedily bowed his head and took his leave. Dispatching his men to find the woman's whereabouts, he got her set of coordinates and rushed to report it accurately to the man. Boss, Miss Thames is filming today. Filming? Yes. Filming for that movie James is directing and Martin is playing the male lead role officially begins today, he informed. Stefan furrowed his brows and demanded there and then, Book the tickets and return. Stunned by his command, he tentatively asked, Are we going back now? Now, book the tickets right away. Subordinate hesitantly reminded his superior, Boss, about that follow-up for the acquisition tomorrow. Did you hear my orders? His boss spun around and lifted his eyes onto him. The anger in them threatened to spill in the next second. Perhaps you also dare to defy me? The assistant, who was greatly alarmed at the man's words, instantly bent his head in submission. He then answered his superior in a trembling voice, I dare not. Stefan glared at him grimly. Book the tickets now. Immediately. Right away. Yes. Yeah. In the affiliated middle school of California University. It was the end of June and midterms were over. The production team rushed to finish filming the scenes by the end of the school holidays. For the shooting process, the production team would complete filming for all the scenes in this location. Once they were done, they would move to another filming location. The scenes were arranged to be filmed by location to minimize the budget spend and reduce the manpower needed in setting up the movie's backdrop. Simply put, simply put, following the timeline in the script would not work when filming, as it would waste a lot of time, money, and effort. The cast changed into different outfits and followed the storyboard to complete their scenes. Filming progress was unexpectedly slow, however. James, with his attentiveness, even the slightest detail, sought for perfection when shooting. Thus, as long as a gaze missed the mark, he would request for a retake. There was even a time when the production team spent two entire days filming the scenes for just the school's anniversary. It was all due to Claire frequently falling into a trance as she stood in the first row. She was not feeling quite herself in those days. The soulless eyes kept floating elsewhere. For several times, James had lashed out to her via his megaphone simply because she was in a daze. The weather was sometimes dreadful in June. Hitting 35 degrees Celsius, it felt extremely stuffy. 
All the actors could not avoid getting exposed to the raging sun for a protracted time due to her mistake. First-rate actors who were out of the frame still managed to cool and hydrate themselves under the trees. The extras, unfortunately, had to suffer along with Claire under the heat. Some with weaker constitutions nearly passed out from the heat. Episode 284 The First On-Screen Kiss Many grumbled to themselves about her, yet they did not dare to voice their complaints aloud. Claire was high up in the celebrity rankings. She was not someone to be trifled with. Isabel magically got a hold of a small battery-operated fan and directed its wind at Monica's face. As for her, she was sweating all over from the sweltering heat. Her artiste had to film under such stuffy weather with heavy makeup on her face. If she perspired so much that her makeup ended up smudging, she would have to wash away all traces of cosmetics on her face and reapply them again. As she would be given close-up shots for the scheduled few outdoor scenes, they could not afford for any flaws to be seen on her face. If there were any bald spots on her foundation, resulting in an uneven complexion, the quality of the shots could not be guaranteed, and a retake had to be done. Therefore, Isabel held up a small electric fan in one hand and kept fanning Monica with a folding fan in another. The actress was heartbroken to see her assistant's face flush from being under the broiling sun. She pushed the fan to her. Look at you! You're heating up! Don't just keep fanning me and mind yourself as well. Please don't get a heat stroke. Her assistant was momentarily astonished. Touched by her thoughtful action, she expressed her feelings. Monica, I realize that you're a nice person. Isn't this normal? How many artists out there treat their assistants like real people? She grumbled. You haven't seen everything yet. Many assistants are their artists punching bags. Slap them over the slightest disagreements. As assistants, we must bear the blame and inconvenience. It's really tiring. Monica, you're different in that you treat me well and are nice to me. It's that serious? She was flabbergasted. Have you heard of Pamela Smith? Her assistant tattled in a hushed voice. Her assistant stepped on her dress before by accident, and in a fit of anger, she splashed a cup of freshly brewed hot tea on her face. That poor assistant had blisters immediately surface on her skin. Monica was dumbfounded. She's that vicious? Otherwise, what do you think? Her assistant chuckled. I'm very fortunate to be following you. Everyone's so envious of me. She blurted out a giggle. What? What are you laughing at? Isabel stared at her, unable to laugh or cry. She frankly verbalized her thoughts. Now that you mention it, it sounds just like an emperor's harem in the ancient times. An artiste is like a concubine while an assistant is her maid. Concubines scheme and compete against each other. How interesting. Isabel could not help but titter at that. <laughs> exactly. That's how this industry works. She displayed a smile, yet her face was veiled with froth. Her face was so cold, one's shoulders would instinctively shudder. She turned around and was surprised to meet Martin, who was now standing near her. He offered her an ice pack, which defused cooling air. Here. Martin, you're done with your scenes? She greeted him cheerily. Martin was previously managed by Drake, and Isabel was under the latter's wing as his assistant. Thus, she was familiar with the superstar. The actor nodded to acknowledge the assistant's presence, he twisted the cap of a bottle, and furiously consumed cold water within. He was dressed in a set of workout clothes, had makeup on his face. Unlike his usual image in front of the camera, Right now, he resembled a teenager of 14 or 15 years of age. He had fair skin, translucent eyes, and a scholarly aura as warm as jade. Yet, none of these suppressed his vitality. He looked exceedingly handsome. Entranced by his side profile when drinking water, Isabel's heart fluttered wildly. So handsome. The witched assistant suddenly shifted her gaze onto her artiste in envy, murmuring, Monica. So jealous of you. You have nothing to be envious of, Monica numbly replied. 
You can act alongside Brother Martin. Oh my, you two look so good together. Absolutely compatible. The scenes produced are going to look great, the assistant exclaimed enthusiastically, clasping her chest. The actress could only smile at her. That's enough silliness out of you. Just as she finished saying that, field assistant hurried over to remind her, Monica, your scene is up next. Please get ready. Uh, understood. Thanks. She nodded and tidied up before she went off. At the side, Isabel saw the man absentmindedly watch her artiste, forlorn gaze never leaving her back. Catching sight of his miserable look, the assistant was lost in her thoughts momentarily. Frankly, those observing them at the site had difficulty telling if the two were acting. As part of the production team working with artistes all year round, she could easily tell whether a person was acting or not, no matter how realistic the artiste's acting was. However, for the last few takes involving the two leads, she often got the impression that while the lady was acting, the gentleman was certainly not. She could see the turmoil in his eyes whenever he looked at her artiste. There were feelings of love and affection that she seemed to be hiding coming from him. It was hard to differentiate whether he was just acting or truly felt that way. His every expression and eye contact revealed his adoration. Not even a seasoned thespian talent could emote with harder. When it came to the feel, it was either real or an act. Hence, the scenes were mostly finished with a single cut. Even the perfectionist James could not nitpick regarding their tapes. In this troubled and forbidden love, Diana Stark's fearlessness and courage and Nathan Stark's buried adoration were wonderfully expressed by both artists. Everyone present was easily led into the plot by their acting. They secretly praised her excellent and believable acting and his sensitive portrayal of the character's emotional depth. Isabel, however, felt that the man was not just acting. Was he too engrossed in the show he took his feelings for real? Is he interested in her? Soon it was nighttime. Only one more scene remained between the couple. The scene was set in the school's music room where the two were left by themselves. According to the plot, this was when the two would reveal their affections for each other. Diana Stark had dragged her brother over to the music room in the middle of the night so that he could teach her how to play a piece by Chopin. Nathan Stark would teach her the finger work while sitting next to her when she, in a momentary lapse of reason, suddenly drew close to kiss him on his lips. He was taken aback. Abruptly, the music notes halted. His sister was unable to control the affections welling within her as she clutched at his chest and put her lips on his. The first kiss between the two protagonists happened in this scene. It was considered as one of the climaxes in the show. The original fans voted this as one of their most anticipated scenes. James had high hopes for this scene, too. Beforehand, Stefan laid down the ground rule that Monica was forbidden from having any kissing or hugging scenes. This put the director in a fix. This was because this scene could not be completed with a stand-in. Episode 285, Superb Acting Skills It was necessary to take close-up shots for this climax. Their every expression, his shock and her nervousness, would need to be shown fully through these close-up shots. Unless the stand-in looked identical to Monica, how would it be possible to complete this take? This was making things difficult for him without a doubt. It was akin to telling him to find two pieces of identical leaves. How was that even possible? On top of that, a stand-in would remain as only a stand-in. This tactic might work for distant shots, but the audience could easily expose a stand-in close-up. In the end, James decided to take a risk. He would secretly complete the segment with two leaps behind Stefan's back. The director's pursuit of his art had become a kind of obsession. The backdrop was finally set up. Monica sat in front of the piano and tapped lightly on its keys. Ding, ding, dong, dong. 
A string of light-hearted piano melodies flowed at the tapping of her fingers. She was only using her right hand to play without the chord charts. Romance was in the air as the beautiful melody complemented the peaceful night. Martin, who was standing behind her while drinking his coffee, blurted out, The way you hit the notes isn't right. She looked up at him with a little smile. Oh. I only learned to play the piano much later. It's how my basic foundation is incomplete. That's why I find it difficult to play the keys correctly now. When she was younger, her father had sent her to a few enrichment classes. She was learning the violin then. Afterward, in university, she switched to a piano specialty. Foundation and finger work, which required a head start at a young age, were basics to playing good piano. As such, while her playing skills could fool any layman, to a professional like Martin, her standard was considered as average. He sat beside her and demonstrated the finger work again. You should play the piece this way. The song sounded patchy with the way you played it earlier. <sighs> he went ahead and corrected the way she held her hand as well. When you play the piano, you need to curl your hand like you hold an egg in it. He then showed her the correct handshake. She seemed so skilled. She chuckled. He gave her a wry smile. Monica, my protege, I've been playing the piano for 24 years now. How can I not be skilled at it? Wow, you're amazing. She complimented sincerely. You're so alike with the male protagonist in the novel. You two are piano princes. I always feel that men who know how to play the piano are elegant. He showed a rare, warm smile. Oh, really? The two went into character before the actual filming, where the man was patiently imparting his knowledge of the piano to the woman. The cameraman quickly recorded this loving scene, intending to post it as a movie teaser on a Weibo sometime later. James, who was reading the script as he kept an eye on the two, heartily commented, exactly the kind of feel I want for the scene. He was pleased and revealed with his toys. Monica might be a rookie, but since they started filming, her bad takes were few and far between. It might be due to her being closely attuned to her character or having a flair for acting. Still, her innate inclination to acting was one worthy of praise, even from someone as critical as him. It was incredible to meet such a newcomer who had talent, presence, look, and nice temperament. He took a script and came up to the two. He then went through his requirements, such as the expression, eye contact, and other minute details with them. All right, everyone, back to your positions and be on standby. A few makeup artists quickly went to the two and touched up their appearances. A staff member brought over a slate and positioned it in front of the camera. Forbidden Love, scene nine, take one, and action. The ninth scene was set in the music room. Everything was consumed in darkness, and one could only gaze up on a starless sky. Within the pitch-black classroom, a narrow slit suddenly appeared at the window. Someone drew the curtains aside from the window edge to let the beautiful and luminous moonlight stream into the room. Nathan Stark, played by Martin, leaned against the windowsill and looked around with wary eyes. Monica, who quickly went into character as Diana Stark, huddled next to him. Carefully tugging at his sleeve, she asked, Brother, are you sure about this? Yes. Teacher on duty already made his rounds and left for the dorms to rest. There isn't anyone left in the music department. Nathan Stark spoke faintly. Quickly after, he signaled his sister with his eyes. Wait for me outside, huh? Okay, be careful. Diana Stark wiggled her head in understanding, a cheeky smile emerging on her face. He grappled onto the ledge of the window, and with an agile leap, he landed on the windowsill and into the room next. She hurriedly made her way to the entrance of the room just as the door was unlocked from the inside. Her brother's bright and satisfied look subsequently entered her sight. Here is that. She let out a soft yet excited squeal before stepping in. Quiet. Worried that her squeal would alert the security making the rounds, he lifted his hand 
and sent single flick to her forehead. Ouch! Fun. She placed her hands over her forehead and threw him an indignant glare. Changing glances, they drew all the curtains in the music room shut. After ensuring that they were firmly closed, one of the lights was then turned on. A warm spot of light cast down to an exquisitely designed Yamaha grand piano. Wow, what a beautiful piano! She hovered a hand over her lips to cover her awe. Her breath was almost taken away. She circled around the piano and surveyed it a couple of times. Joy overflowed from her features. All the romantic, music fantasies of a teenage girl bloomed on her face. She loved to sit next to him whenever his younger self practiced playing the piano, and she became besotted with observing him try a monotonous piece of music repeatedly. She was infatuated with that pair of long and slender hands pressing on the piano keys. In addition, his fingertips, which were smooth like ceramic, looked absolutely stunning as they danced around the black and white keys of the instruments. The moonlight outside poured in and projected its brilliance onto his handsome side profile. With his back turned against its rays, his silhouette formed a silent yet lovely scene. She did not come to like the piano at first. Her fascination and love for it stemmed from her brother's infatuation with it. He helplessly glanced at her repeatedly going around the piano. With his hands tucked in his pockets, he pulled his lips upward to form a gentle yet loving arch. Brother, how much does this piano cost? She inquired earnestly and stroked the piano longingly, her movement akin to a devout praying. It's very expensive. How expensive is expensive? Um, about $20,000. He thought it over before telling her. She was completely flabbergasted at the price. Her eyes bulged to the size of bronze bells in her disbelief. It must sound great, then. Yes. It's piano strictly for concert use. James examined the scene through the monitor as he stroked his chin lightly. The story was progressing in an unbelievably smooth pace. Be it of the superstar or the newbie, every movement and detail of their characters was executed to the point. Episode 286, A Definite Launch to Fame The care and vigilance Nathan Stark expressed and the uneasiness and anxiety Diana Stark displayed when they trespassed into the music room, as well as the amazement the latter had for the grand piano, all these expressions and emotions were vividly conveyed by the two leads. She completely portrayed a teenage girl's innocence and love for romance. Sitting before the camera, the director held his breath until the last moment of the scene and then shouted, Okay. The take was actually completed, sans him having to shout, Cut. Monica quickly got out of character and made her way to the monitor where James was. She observed the shots the camera had last captured and analyzed the director's stern expression. He was looking at the screen solemnly as he went over the take from the start again. She felt a little jittery, afraid that he would disapprove of her performance. Director James? He interrupted her words, and thereafter pointed to a close-up shot of her in the camera. He had paused and said, What is the close-up here? She bent down next to him and watched him replay the take for her from the beginning. When the camera panned to this close-up shot of hers, he paused the take and turned to look at her. She easily understood his intention. My expression isn't good enough. Mm. He thought that she had a rather keen awareness. Your eyes lack expressiveness. The adoration Diana Stark holds for Nathan Stark isn't completely shown. The long shot is perfect, but the close-up is lacking a lot. She went through the description the author had written for the scene in her head repeatedly. Director, I understand. Do a makeup scene for this part. She motioned her head in comprehension and returned to her position right away. The director gulped down a mouthful of water. He could hardly contain the astonishment in his heart. He was especially strict with filming, 
Disney seldom praised anyone on set. Those involved in his production, from first-tier actors to nameless extras, were treated equally by him. Nearly everyone had received his tongue lashing at least once. On the first day of filming, the inexperienced Monica could not find the camera often and committed big errors with her positioning. She frequently moved out of frame, too. Because of this, she had her fair share of criticisms from him. He chastised her harshly, disregarded that it was her first time acting or that she was an inexperienced newbie. Many gloated over this. Pamela and Claire, in particular, were taking great pleasure from her receiving reprimand. She was usually shunned in the production team for two reasons. One reason was that she was the newbie at Foxcom. Being relatively young, she had the looks and the talent in acting as well. Everyone was aware that she could shoot the fame, and all she lacked was the opportunity. Now, this movie was her chance. All of them believed that as long as she put her all into this production, it was not an exaggeration to say that she would catapult to fame. This newbie would surely become famous. Therefore, the two veteran actresses eyed her menacingly. They were afraid that after she shot the fame, the company would provide her with more resources instead, and she, in turn, would rise in status. There was too much competition and stress in the entertainment industry. It was not simple for artists to make names for themselves. Kamala became well-known with the help of an investor and the efforts of her team in planning for and packaging her. Her increment in status was largely dependent on scandals and intentional hype. She was unskilled in acting, but she always appeared in the news, and this was due to her stunning looks and her team's effort to create hype for her. Claire was different, however. She debuted as a child actress and stepped foot in the entertainment industry at a young age. At the age of five, she starred as a young princess in a drama about an imperial harem. As a child actress who had successfully transitioned into a full-fledged actress, she had many experiences in shooting for production. Unfortunately, her acting skill was just up to par, and this was her biggest weakness in her career as an artiste. Appearances could be improved with plastic surgery, and fame could be increased by creating a buzz to attract attention. However, her lack of skill in acting remained as her Achilles heel. Given Monica's superior aptitude to hers, she would naturally eye her with hostility. Another reason was none other than her becoming the female lead despite being a rookie actress. The competition for this role was originally between Pamela and Claire, but when Monica parachuted into the team, the two past rivals instantly became present allies. It was indeed as the saying went, The enemy of my enemy is my friend. As such, after being criticized by James, the two banded together and went to ridicule her. Unfortunately for them, Monica was someone who remained indifferent to honor or disgrace. She did not take their taunts to heart. Throughout the night, she carefully analyzed the issue with her positioning. On the next day of filming, her positioning improved tremendously, and there appeared to be no major issues. Even if there were, they were only minor flaws, and her takes were quickly compensated for under James's instructions. He was extremely shocked by this, yet he did not compliment her before the others. He wanted to praise her badly, but he could not do that. He rarely did commend someone. If he were to do so before everyone else, they would definitely be envious of her. Thus, regardless of her excellent performance, he never did let his happiness surface. In reality, he was absolutely satisfied with her performance, which was better than what he had expected. She was even better than Martin in acting. He landed a slap to his thigh. Once he thought of the upcoming kissing scene, he was simply blushing in excitement. He looked forward to her performance. The following take was also quickly done. Soon, they were about to film the tense scene. Thrilled, he ran over to where the pair was to explain the scene. There were a few kissing scenes in the entire novel, and there were only five throughout the movie. According to the script, 
The first kiss occurred between Nathan Stark and Diana Stark in this particular scene. Monica had mentally prepared herself for the kiss in advance. Only a few words described it in the novel. So when she heard that the director had requested for a close-up shot for this scene, her face immediately turned a few shades of crimson. When you act out the kiss, you need to immerse yourself fully in it. Diana Stark's innocence, nervousness, and thunderous heartbeats, as well as Nathan Stark's unrest and helplessness, must be properly portrayed. For some reason, she was suddenly a little out of sorts during his instructions. Stefan's charming yet refined voice rang in her ears. Kiss me. He was the first person she had kissed. Before that, she had no experience in it whatsoever. She vividly recalled him gracefully stretching himself in front of her. His pair of deep-set eyes laid on her body as his lips formed a sinister yet provocative upward curve. He whispered to her, Please me. As he solicited a kiss from her, he kept hold of her floundering hands and pulled her into his chest. He then pressed her body against a wall and domineeringly deepened the kiss to the point of oxygen depletion. With her fingers locked together, they experienced a kiss so intense they seemed to melt into each other's blood and bones. However, at the thought of him doing that while he affectionately entangled his body with another woman's, an ill feeling uncontrollably rose from her chest. Episode 287, The Forbidden Love, Scene 10, Take 1. Was it jealousy that turned into a rage? Monica! The director raised his voice to redirect her attention back to him. She immediately recollected her thoughts and retorted, Why, Director James? You lost your concentration. James was slightly displeased and knocked her head with the rolled-up script. She stuck out her tongue ruefully. Sorry. Is there anything else you don't understand? He asked. She and Martin exchanged fleeting glances as the director's voice was heard again. Monica, I'll be using recorder B to do the close-up for you in this kissing scene. Remember to stick to your position later, and don't move away from the recorder. She glanced up at the few recorders around them and nodded. James returned to his seat for the monitor. Everyone be on standby! The log keeper with the clapper board took his position at the front and shouted, The Forbidden Love, Scene 10, Take 1. Action! At the snapping sound of the clapper board, both artists immersed themselves into their respective roles. This was a simple scene. As Nathan Stark was coaching his sister for the play of the piano piece, Serenade, Diana Stark, unable to suppress her overwhelming adoration, embraced and kissed her brother. The critical point in this scene was the emotional development between the two protagonists in their first ever kiss. The girl's brave initiative and the boy's cowardly avoidance. The scene embodied the essence of the film. The two were biological siblings that were inappropriately intimate with each other since they were small. The sister always relied on her brother, and he meant the world to her. There was a passage in the novel which went, At the end of the day, Kinship is a really strange thing. It is the fetters that tie two people together in tight bonds. At the same time, it also carves cruel chasm, which is impossible to cross between the two. When I was young, I used to feel fortunate to have such a doting elder brother who treated me as the apple of his eye. I thought I was the most blessed girl in the whole world. Now that I've grown up, I hate the fact that the blood flowing within me is also in the man whom I love with my whole being. We walk the same way, we love on the same path, and we commit the same wrong. From ignorant affection and girly adoration to a strong desire for us to be together always, the secular decorum just had to barge in and heartlessly pull us apart. How far is forever? In a thought is eternity. Even a lapse of judgment can result in shame. Brother, do you know that, even though the world is big, there is no place for me, and there is none whom I can depend on? Can anyone, even God, tell me what love is? If no one can properly explain that to me, then why can't I love Nathan Stark? Nathan Stark, 
he was born in one bitter cold winter. As for Diana Stark, she was born on the hottest day in summer. Both siblings were polar opposites, just like winter and summer. The first word that the girl uttered was brother. The first name she learned from blobbering along was also his name, Nathan Stark. He was older than her by five years. During their childhood, their parents were busy with work, and the four of them hardly spent time together. Thus, to the young girl, her brother was her most reliable and faithful partner. Nathan Stark had sharp features and was smart-looking. Hence, many girls had liked him since he was small. However, he was rather aloof and preferred to keep to himself. He stayed away from other children, even from his parents. This might have to do with the cold season that he was born in. Nathan's aloofness became more apparent when he entered his rebellious phase. The only one who could get close to him was his sister. To him, she was someone precious. It might have to do with the kinship that he had with her. Even his parents could not match the love he had for her. The young him did not realize that the nature of their relationship had changed. It was at a crossroads. His sister's dependency on him had gradually turned into possessiveness. The two were so close that they slept on the same bed until junior high school. When she entered high school, her body hit puberty. The boy was a freshman then. After his biology class, he came to understand sexuality. Hence, he slowly distanced himself from his sister's intimacy. The difference between him and Diana Stark was that, when the latter entered puberty, she was quick to discover that her love for him had gone beyond the norm. She also realized, with much uneasiness, that she was destined to stay apart from her brother. She wanted to maintain this conflicting relationship with him forever, one that seemed close, yet actually distant. She knew that one day, a third party would appear between them. The thought of this person would uninhibitedly possess his arms, chest, and loving tenderness drove her into a panic she had never experienced before. She could not imagine him holding someone else as more important than her, and a time when his love and care would not just be for her. She was horrified at how much she resisted this possibility and hated the idea of a third party. There was once when she caught sight of him walking home with a female classmate. That triggered her jealousy tremendously. Nonetheless, she knew very well that her love for him was abnormal. She was incestuous. Still, admittedly, he was the first one to love her and dote on her the most in this life. He made her heart throb with delight, and just the thought of him filled her with happiness. Alas, she could not love him. She had tried very hard to suppress her feelings for him, until that segment in the music room where she could no longer hold back her affections. This was how the kissing scene came about. She wanted to enter a talent show and chose to play the piano. She was an amateur when it came to this musical instrument. She did not pick it up when she was much younger. When she was a small girl, she was satisfied with sitting beside him as he practiced the piano. Her brother deliberately took her to the music room to reinforce her foundation overnight. Ding, ding, dong, dong. Chopin's serenade gently flowed from his fingertips. All along, he was focusing on her fingering keyboard and seeing her innocent hand positioning, patiently guided and instructed her. As for her, she was distracted from the task at hand by his side profile. What's the matter? Looking up, he was startled to see her staring gently at him from the side. Think. Then let's continue. He took her hand and held the keyboard. His sister suddenly hooked onto his hand tightly and refused to let go. She held his hand with such force he could sense her knuckles trembling slightly against his. In fact, his shock increased when he found her hand releasing cold sweat as her knuckles turned white. Father, can we stay together always? Can't we? She asked hesitantly at point blank and almost pleadingly. Alarm flashed across his eyes and he did not say a word in response.
Episode 288, First On-Screen Kiss. Diana Stark was stabbed in the heart when her brother maintained his silence. In a suffocated tone, she implored, Brother, I hate to see you with other girls. Can we keep to our childhood promise to be together always? Be together for a hundred years and forever. Her naive plea was accompanied by a frantic and desperate look. She was hoping to have her brother embrace her and tell her, yes, let's be together forever. He did none of these, however. Tremblingly, he pried open her clutching fingers one by one. His ashen face was full of resignation as he looked at her and said, Be good. Don't spout nonsense, yeah? I'm not talking nonsense. I mean it. She inched closer to him and urged solemnly, We really want to be with you always, brother. This has always been our promise to each other, right? Diana, your sibling. There will come a day when I'll have a girl whom I love to be my wife. That girl will be with me forever, and not you. Understand? Why? Her face turned as white as a sheet of paper with his words. These cruel words drove a wedge deep into her heart. Her eyes rimmed with tears immediately. She clenched her fists tightly. Despondency, which could be seen in her eyes, almost swallowed her whole. What kind of promise did you give me in the past? Is it a lie? You clearly promised me. His eyes, filled with haze, turned to stare at the black and white keyboard and said, I did promise you that we'll always be together and never be apart. But it's not in this manner. Do you understand? There was a silence on her side now. He furrowed his brows and was about to open his mouth as he looked up at her when she suddenly pounced on him. With her little face inching close to his, her hand looped around his neck. Before he could regain his composure, her face closed in on his, copying the actions of those characters depicted in a comic she had read. She flapped her eyes close and gently plastered her lips onto his cool chin ones. This was Diana Stark's first kiss, as well as Monica's first on-screen kiss. Just like the protagonist she was portraying, her kissing skill was bad. As her upper torso leaned on Martin, she almost felt the warmth from his chest and the strong beating of his heart through the flimsy fabric. He gave off an inexplicable fresh scent that was different from Stefan's cologne. It smelled of natural freshness. Just as she placed her lips onto his, that domineering man's handsome but angry face flashed across her mind. Woman, how dare you betray me? Betray? Who is betraying who now? She closed her eyes lightly and forcefully wiped that face off her mind. As for the script, she hugged his shoulders as she leaned further and deeper into his arms. Her greedy lips wanted more of him as her kiss swallowed further in his fresh breath. Nathan Stark was supposed to struggle free from her embrace at this moment. He would push her away harshly and reign in the situation that was getting out of control. However, Martin hesitated. With his eyes wide open, he saw with clarity Monica's sweet face before him. Her eyes were shut lightly as she drew close, and her shoulders were tense and withdrawn. She seemed to think that kissing was a very scared action. She approached him while she trembled in trepidation. Her anxiety was to the extent that even her eyelashes were vibrating. Tears welled up in her eyes and wetted her lashes as they seeped down the corners leaving a streak of watery path on her cheeks. This kiss was a despondent cry for him. Monica was totally into her character. Her every facial feature, down to her every strand of lashes, expressed the dramatic emotions of the protagonist. Martin struggled inside his heart as he watched her throw herself fully into the act. He was moved by her desperate kiss. His heart ached for her. At the same time, inkling of love and reluctance to let go rose from within him. The male protagonist was supposed to reject her advances and avoid the kiss at this juncture. However, he could not shake off his real desire. He wanted this woman's kiss so much, he could not find the strength to push her away. Without knowing what he was doing, he 
stretched out his arm to hold the restless and desperate girl in front of him. The assistant director, who was sitting next to the monitor, swiftly stood up with disapproval on face. The superstar had lost control of himself. According to the script, his next action should be to push her away forcefully and not to embrace her. He was about to interrupt the acting when, without warning, James pulled him back to his seat by his sleeve. James, he whispered, curious on why the director had stopped him. Don't talk. Obviously, the director was pleasantly surprised by their improvised acting. This was a blessing in disguise, actually. While the star did step out of his role, he astounded the director with his realistic performance. It's the feeling I'm looking for. Because, to Nathan, he actually longed for this kiss. He, too, loved Diana. But unlike his sister, he lacked the courage. He was the rational type that would not let himself commit any action against the acceptable norm. Hence, when he found himself having romantic desires for his sister, he quickly reined himself in and even got a female classmate to return home with him. Although he constantly kept his distance from her, his heart would still not stop desiring her and her kiss. How the star was developing the plot right now was actually the best way to portray the inner conflict of the male protagonist. His hesitation very well displayed the struggle between love and rationality of the character. Feelings were something that could not be controlled in the first place, right? This way, the character would be more three-dimensional and feel more real. Do a close-up for Nathan Stark. James hurriedly pulled in another reporter for this unexpected turn of events. The original intention was to do a close-up of only Diana Stark to show her helplessness and hopelessness. Now, the director wanted to do the same with the male protagonist, and his intention was to capture every change in the man's facial expression clearly. From the camera lens, his facial expression had transformed into one of shock. It was as if he had returned to reality all of a sudden and realized that they were merely acting a scene. His arms held suspended in the air for a while before he hastily pushed her away. He stood up without warning and turned his body away from her, looking pale with alarm and ridicule. She hit the piano at his push. Her elbows hit the black and white keys and they emitted dissonant basses, sounding shrill and heavy. These discordant sounds reflected the two's emotional states very well. She looked embarrassed and hapless as she stood up. With a dry laugh, she retorted with shaking lips, Mother, why did you push me away? Don't you find this ridiculous? He touched his lip flaps where her warmth lingered still, and his eyes dulled as he asked the question. How is this ridiculous? Tell me, why is it ridiculous? She choked, as she straightened her body from the piano stool. Walking toward him from behind, she tugged at his sleeve, just like what she used to do when she was much younger. Why can't I kiss you? Episode 289 A Belated Rage why can't I kiss you? You can't. Martin, who was fully engrossed in his role by then, replied in a heavy tone. And neither can I. He roughly pulled his sleeve away from her hand, walked toward the window, and stood in front of it. Why can't we? Diana stared at his back miserably. I like you, and you like me. Isn't that good enough? She held her last sentence and almost broke her voice. James sat at the monitor screen. His body was almost shaking with hyped emotions. It's just too good. Tension is overwhelming. Oh my God. Monica is really exceptional. Indeed, he had good foresight. In the screen, Nathan was seen turning to face his sister abruptly. He, with his bloodshot eyes, held her shoulders painfully tight and screamed back, You're my sister! And I'm your brother. Do you understand? This is why we can't be together. We shouldn't be together. Understand? Why can't we be together? The young and naive Diana, who could not fathom his rationale, 
for sisters. I can't do without you, brother. We share the same blood. We're siblings. It's incest. Incest. Do you understand now? He held her gaze tightly, as if trying to wake her up from this dream. She broke out into a cold and bitter laugh. Clasping his hands with hers, she stacked them together. Is this the reason? Her wet eyes looked at him mournfully as she said, If this is the reason, then let me cut it open with a knife. I'll let the blood in my body run clean. Is that enough? Shut up. Are you a fool or are you threatening me? He clasped her lips tightly as his heart thumped with fear over her angry words. She broke down without warning. Plunging headlong into his arms, she sobbed weakly and helplessly. I really don't want to see you with another girl. It makes my heart ache and causes me to feel pain. Brother, I really like you. There's nothing I can do about it. I wish I could control my feelings. I can't. He seemed to lose his will and power as well. His arms hung loosely at his flanks as he ceaselessly muttered, can't be together. This isn't allowed. <laughs> Tears rolled down her cheeks and slipped into the side of her lips. She opened her mouth a few times. But no words came forth. He hugged her, full of heartache. Sorrow and pain lined his eyes as his brows knitted helplessly at their plight. The scene was supposed to end at this hug. However, strangely, the director did not stop them with a bellow of cut. The filming set fell into a deafening silence. Without further instructions from the director, Monica did not know how to proceed. Why is the director not giving instructions even though the scene has come to an end? Martin looked up and his eyes froze. She noted his startled expression. Physical, she also turned to look at James, who was in front of the monitor. With a look of trepidation and fear, the director stood with his back ramrod straight as he stared in the direction of the door. Bewildered, she followed the direction of his gaze to her back and the music room entrance. The door was wide open. From the outside, the night was dark and heavy. A tall and lean figure was standing high at the door. The man wore a black shirt that seemed to blend into the black skyline. His overpowering presence hung heavily and eerily over the production set. Everyone nearly suffocated from this. She was totally paralyzed. Immediately, she could sense a dreadful horror robbing her breath and pushing her to the brink. The man stood brilliantly at the door with his hands in his pockets. His wind-blown raven fringe might cover his eyes, but it failed to hide the mess breaking through his chilling glare. There was not one bit of expression on his handsome, frosty face. However, she could sense daggers shooting at her, fierce and sharp, from his ominous eyes in the dark and cold night. Her body instantly shook uncontrollably, and she stumbled a few steps back. The man's level of gaze rose slightly as he lifted his chin, his cold lips angling in a disdainful arc. Why aren't you continuing? She felt stifled not knowing how much and how far he had seen. She desperately tried to calm herself down. She was an actress, and this was acting only. Why should she feel guilty about it? Things should not be taken as real, right? Besides, he was the one who betrayed her first, right? He was also having an indiscriminate relationship with Gracia, was he not? His so-called fiancé even flaunted about their good times openly before her. What is he posturing before me now? Is he angry? I haven't flared up yet. Shouldn't he be the one to reflect on his action instead? Why is he looking at me now? I find the one in the wrong. Still, under his icy glare, the strong argument did not seem to hold weight. She was the one looking guilty now. Her feet grew cold as she stood stiffly on the spot. Isn't it exciting? Why did you stop? frosty voice boomed again, reducing the temperature in the entire production set into sub-zero level. Everyone shivered at the sight of the same green man, and their shoulders retracted fearfully. This was especially so for James, with the look of horror on his face. Why is he here, of all places? From what he knew, 
The man should be in London for a long stretch due to an important acquisition. He should not be bought so soon, right? In the dead and quiet night, he slowly strode into the room. As he took a step forward, she retreated one. The more he moved in, further she backed away. His icy eyes looked foreign and scary to her. Seeing her cowering behind Martin, he let out a sharp burst of angry laughter. His eyes then glinted with threat. Come over. Her voice, ever so light, was encased with frost. She stood rooted to the ground, unable to move at his command. Her tarrying only infuriated him further. Come over. This is the second time I'm telling you that. He glared at her now. If looks could kill, she would die a million times. What a woman. He was only gone for a few days, and she dared to block his number. Not knowing what had happened, he hurriedly flew back to check on her. Instead, what is she doing? She's here, hugging and kissing a man? Episode 290 No, Stefan. James looked on in horror as he contemplated on how he could pull them down. His priority was to extinguish Stefan's flaming rage. Seeing the man lose his temper and direct his incense on her, Monica steadily retreated from fright. Her hands and feet were now clammy. Martin perceived the man's murderous intent and pulled her back in composure to protect her while he cautiously inspected his every movement. The director thought that everything was about to take a turn for the worse and rubbed his hands nervously. He stepped in immediately and got between them to prevent things from spiraling out of control. Mr. Lewis. The man halted in the step and peered at the director from the corner of his eye as he cast his unfeeling eyes downward. Mr. Lewis, don't take their kiss as real. A scene is shot using forced perspective. Before the director could finish his words, Stefan grasped the fistful of his collar and dragged his body before him. You think I'm easy to deceive, like a child? Forced perspective. Who are you trying to fool? His chilly dark orbs instantly contracted. Haven't I told you that she's not allowed to have any kissing scenes? Have you turned a deaf ear to my orders? James crashed to the floor with a dull thud due to the great amount of inertia as Stefan furiously swung his hand. The assistant director and several staff on set were taken aback. They made their way over to their executive director in panic and helped him up. Monica witnessed this in horror. Dr. James. Concerned with the severity of his fall, she wanted to rush to his side, but was firmly pulled by Martin behind him again. Enraged and annoyed, she shot Stefan a glare, only to be mocked by the latter. You still have the heart to be concerned with others. Very well. Wonderful. What a wonderful turn of events. He had warned James that she was off limits for intimate contact with any male actors. However, as a subordinate, he actually dared to defy his orders. What about his woman? What was she doing while he was out of the country? Flirting with other male actors and being in love? He saw this for himself today. What about the other times? What was she doing behind his back? Stefan's cutting gaze slowly panned toward Martin's hand, which held Monica's arm tightly, and a chilling arch came to the corner of his lips. Monica glanced over at James, who was wearing a pained expression. Fear, frustration, and reproach all came to her at once, and she felt a false sense of suffocation. It was unavoidable. Still, she thought that her conscience was clear. Kissing scenes were the most common parts of a production. Everything she did in front of the camera was according to the script. Other than that, she always maintained a safe distance from the male lead. She really had a clear conscience. Monica gritted her teeth and raised her voice. Stefan, what are you doing? You're directing your rage at others. His eyes immediately shrank, and he cast a piercing gaze. You too are aware that I'm fuming now? She stared back at him with hurried breath. He demanded once more. Come here. I'm giving you three seconds. Go over to him? Fine. She had not committed anything wrong, right? Inhaling a deep, chilling breath, she took a small step forward, only to be stopped by Martin again. Monica, don't go over. 
He did not fear Stefan. He lifted his chin and met the man's apathetic stare. Stefan, so you resort to these despicable means to force Monica into doing your bidding? Monica? Smirk of disdain tugged at his lips. What an affectionate form of address. Martin, you sure know how to pester her. The man countered. The two men stood face to face. It was a battle between ice and fire. The invisible clash between the two auras spread to every corner of the set. It was akin to the fierce collision of countless spears in midair. The man's piercingly cold gaze laid on the hand gripping her, and he demanded in a solemn voice, Remove your hand from her. The superstar's emotionless eyes met his. He did not fear his threat at all. Holding her hand even tighter, he even locked his fingers with hers. She scrutinized Stefan's sinking expression, and she writhed about to dislodge her hand from the superstar's. The superstar steadfastly clung onto her hand, however, and even turned to assure her, I'm here, don't be afraid. His comforting words could not, unfortunately, calm her nerves. Undoubtedly, his protection only served to fuel the man's rage. She did not wish to infuriate this man, nor did she wish to implicate the innocent. The director propped himself up using his staff's shoulder and spectated that the field of the fight which was currently charged full of volatile energy. Something clicked in his mind at that moment while he observed his superior, whose fury made all the muscles in his body tighten. Could Monica be his woman? Was it because of this that he issued the injunction order and forbade her from having any kissing scenes during the filming of this deduction, or from having any intimate contact with people of the opposite gender? Was this because of his possessiveness toward her? Then... What about Martin? Why was he going up against their boss? What exactly was he thinking of? James, who was suddenly stressed out, felt a slight headache coming on. He absolutely did not expect for the situation to get out of hand. Let her go. Stefan issued his ultimatum. He could certainly not hold his temper any longer. Who did the superstar think he was to have the audacity to fight him? Monica trembled from head to toe from the immense fear she was feeling right now. The superstar sensed her fingers, iciness, and ceaseless shivering. Clasping her palm more securely to his, he pulled her back even further behind him in a bid to protect her instead of letting her go. Very well. The man dragged his lips into a murderous concave arc as he marched toward the two. James realized that things were about to blow up and get more out of him. He quickly bit his teeth and stepped forward to stop a superior. He spared him no attention, though and in the moment's heat, sent him flying to the side with his kick. The elderly man collided against the prop container, and his head and vision subsequently spun. Her complexion instantly paled ghastly. She was about to stop the man when she noticed him tramping toward the superstar. No, Stephen! She exclaimed. The superstar quickly shoved her out of his and the man's area of confrontation. She lost her balance as a corollary and her body hit the wall. When she recovered from this, she saw the man already run the mop. He fisted the superstar's collar and sent a punch to his face. The superstar, who was unprepared, received a sturdy blow straight on. His face twisted to the side from the impact, and a constant streak of blood quickly flowed from a cut to the corner of his lips. She trembled from fright at the sight. With bated breath, she tried to intervene in the tooth fight, she was dragged to the side by a crew member. Monica, don't go over. It's too dangerous. Blood having rushed to their heads in a fit of anger, the two men fought with equal ferociousness. If they were just a bit careless with their moves and hurt her, her bones would surely shatter from the blow. Slowly straightening his posture, the superstar's long fingers went over to his lips as he tasted blood when his tongue glided over it. Stefan's fist certainly out to kill. At a very young age, the man was thrown into a special military boot camp by Peter to undergo hellish training. It was by no means a child's play to taste blood at gunpoint. Episode 291 You Dare Compete With Me Martin did not execute any techniques 
by going through a 10-year-long intensive training. But each move he made was fatal and carried a horrifying amount of power. However, he was no simple character as well. On screen, he portrayed himself as a dignified scholar, but off screen, having the blood of the most influential Lee family in the underworld running in his veins, which was something unknown to the masses, he was actually a skilled fighter too. Lifting his emotionless eyes, his features were currently encased in a veil of frost. After he unbuttoned his sleeves with a hand, he thrust his foot in the air with tremendous force to deliver a devastating kick straight to his opponent's face. Stefan swiftly dodged his kick and firmly held the latter's leg. Still, he was forced a few steps back by the attack's huge impact. Taking advantage of the situation, the superstar subsequently landed a fierce uppercut to his face. Monica was seriously dumbfounded and watched the horror unfold with a troubled look. She had never seen such a frightening scene before. Thus, the two men, equally matched in strength, started a fight against each other. They executed no fancy techniques, but every attack they delivered against each other was backed by firm strength and lightning fast speed. Each move of theirs was life-threatening. The props at the set that unfortunately suffered the brunt of their combat were crushed into a pile of debris. Fast. They were too fast. The man skillfully defended against the superstar's punch, and with his eyes glinting, sent a sword-like chop to his opponent's inner elbow, hearing a satisfying low groan thereafter. The superstar refused to admit defeat and went all out with his counterattack. The two men's moves were swift and left bruises on each other's body upon contact. The sound of their fight resounded throughout the set, and in the blink of an eye, they had already exchanged more than ten moves. Their attacks were truly as fast as lightning. Everyone was stunned speechless, and for a moment, stood rooted to their respective spots. No one saw how these two attacked and defended themselves. Nonetheless, they seemed to notice the weariness on the superstar's face. Bang! Stefan punched the air with his foot in the direction of the superstar's abdomen. The latter agilely avoided the attack, and it landed a heavy blow on a camera crane. The equipment, which was made of steel, toppled over with a resounding crack. Its crash to the ground echoed out deafeningly. She looked on, shuddering in fear, and dared not imagine anything. If Martin had failed to dodge that kick, his ribs would have certainly been broken. Stop fighting! Martin! Stop fighting! Monica rumpled her hair in distress as she watched the ensuing fight of two with worry-filled eyes. She was so nervous for them, she was about to burst into tears. James and the others were already struck dumb just by spectating the fight. The man's reflexes were quick and deadly and within a few seconds, the superstar already appeared to be at a disadvantage. The scene had everyone instinctively shuddering in fright. At present, the large music room had become a complete mess. Undoubtedly, at the end of the battle, both sides would suffer. This was not what she wanted. This was absolutely not what she wanted to witness. She could no longer look on and do nothing. Otherwise, something bad might really happen. This time... Stefan executed a sudden roundhouse kick, which hit Martin's abdomen. The latter collided against the blackboard with a thud. He watched the man clench his fist and aim a heavy blow at his nose bridge. In a flash, she desperately rushed forward and threw herself in front of the superstar. She hugged his shoulders firmly and yelled, Stop fighting! Her scream was nearly ear-piercing. Stefan's heart tightened. He noticed that he was about to land a blow on her shoulder and thought of the monstrous tower contained behind his fist. She might be crippled by its impact if it were to hit her. He gritted his teeth. Unable to retract his fist in time, he sharply veered its force to the side. The punch barely brushed past Martin's ear and landed on the blackboard with a heavy thud. The blackboard was holed by the punch's impact. A deafening silence pervaded the entire room in an instant. The superstar opened his eyes. He was already drenched in cold sweat. His vision laid on Stefan's fist. Splinters on the blackboard had pierced and bloodied it. He then transferred his gaze onto Monica, who had thrown herself into his chest. 
Her sudden act of shielding him from harm's way with her body, with her eyes firmly shut, bewildered him. Grappling her shoulders, he yelled in a frenzy, Monica, are you out of your mind? Stefan took back his fist with a stern expression. Droplets of fresh blood trickled down from his fingertips and dyed the ground red. When such a scene met his eyes, his heart seemed to be penetrated by a sharp blade. This woman came dashing in without hesitation and used her body to shield another man instead of him. What was the meaning of this? This irked him. This truly irked him. There was a moment when he considered sending the superstar to his death. He ignored the injury in his hand and ferociously dragged her out of the superstar's embrace to face him. Seething with rage, he demanded through his teeth, Woman, are you seeking death? His low yet furious growl nearly deafened her ears. He was glaring at her with his handsome yet nearly bloodshot eyes. Was she going to take that punch for Martin? She would die. Did she not know? Monica pried her eyes apart and gazed in shock at the man who was almost boiling mad with fury before her. Having a fit of hysterics, rage seemed to spurt out of his eyes in an attempt to devour her. She was suddenly really afraid. She was truly afraid of this man from the bottom of her heart. Stop fighting, all right? She shielded the superstar with her body, despite her exhaustion, and promptly lowered her stance. Don't hurt him anymore! Don't hurt him anymore? Clenching both his fists tightly, flames of wrath that appeared in his eyes seemed to be capable of burning her. The superstar was not hurt alone in the fight. He was hurt too. Did she not see? Why did she only go on about the superstar's well-being? Did she only have her eye on another man? He was on the brink of losing his control out of jealousy. Seeing her hold up her hands protectively before the superstar, he roared a warning at her. Don't touch him! Her movement stiffened immediately, and she retracted her hands instinctively. Monica, I'm warning you. If you dare touch him again, I'll let him die without a burial. His threat broke to no room for discussion. He could definitely kill the superstar. Sure enough, she heeded his warning and steered away from him. She did not doubt that he would break the superstar's fingers if she were to touch him at all. Don't be mad anymore! With fuming eyes and rage, Stefan pinched her chin at once. Don't be mad. Don't you think that it's a bit too late for you to say that now? Martin achingly held his arm and straightened himself up. He then said, infuriatingly, You're not allowed to touch her. Get out! The man dealt a kick to his abdomen once more, and groaning in pain, the superstar fell to the ground in exhaustion. She shuddered and dared not spout another word again. The man pulled her into his arms at once and sized up the superstar emotionlessly. The thin lips mercilessly formed a slight smirk. Martin, how dare you compete with me? You're still a tad too green. Stefan, what is up with you trying to make things difficult for a lady? Episode 292 I Am Her Only Man Martin was unwilling to succumb to the man's threat. He got back on his feet, using his remaining strength, only to be sent crashing to the floor again by Stefan's kick. The latter was now eyeing him coldly and cuttingly. Did you try to abduct my woman while I'm away? Martin, how dare you? The man stepped onto his abdomen with mirthless, bloodshot eyes. The superstar snickered. What rights do you have? To say that she's your woman. My rights? The man turned to look at the woman beside him. Yanking her chin up, his evil yet seductive voice sounded. You tell him. Who do you belong to? Hmm. Monica's ruddy lips were trembling in fear. Her every second of hesitation infuriated him without a doubt. Tell him. He clenched her shoulders with such force that she yelped in pain. The young man on the floor saw how still and frightened she was and gave a heart-wrenching scream like a madman. Stefan, 
You're not entitled to touch her. Let go. Let her go. What gave you the rights to force her? Shut up. The man grabbed him by the collar and sneered. Entitlement? With a face void of expression, he plastered close to the superstar's ear and icily mouthed. I am her only man. Is this entitlement sufficient? Instantly, the latter's face drained of all colors. Despicable. You've overestimated yourself. The man jerked him away. Looking at the man lying on the floor, she saw blood seep at the corner of his lips and the bruises on his arm. Greatly alarmed, she clung onto Stefan's waist and muttered with her trembling lips, I'm... I'm... The man bowed his head and looked at her intensely. Her will broke as she looked at him dully and uttered despondently, I'm your woman. Isn't that enough? That isn't enough, Frank. Don't be angry anymore. I'll be obedient from now on, all right? Take it out on me. Don't hurt others anymore. That is all my fault. Don't hurt others anymore. I'm scared. Martin could only stare at her stricken face. His heart ached beyond words. I'm not. Don't speak anymore. She told him through clenched teeth. Please don't say anything else. Don't you beg him. The man grabbed her wrist in one sweep, at which she tried to bear the suffocating pain in silence. Seeing her silently wince in pain at his rough behavior, the superstar felt the pain from his injuries doubling up. The man simply forcibly gathered the woman into his embrace and turned to walk away. James watched the departing back of the menacing man, and his heart went out to the pitiful woman. He was about to follow them when he saw from his periphery Superstar struggled to his feet and chase after the pair. He gave a hard slap on his thigh before he followed suit. At the gate, there was a row of black limousines parked at the junction road. The man had almost carried her all the way to the sports car parked at the front row. His steps were long and brisk, and she awkwardly let him carry her without struggle. She could vividly sense that he was trying to suppress his fury. His handsome face looked stiff and rigid with his eyes burning. This man was looking very, very angry now. In fact, she could not tell what fate awaited her after this. Stefan! The man halted his steps without turning. Only his smoldering eyes shone with enough frost to cut. Behind him, Martin's wand voice rang out. If you really are a man, then make sure you protect her well. If you're only toying with her, then I won't give up. We'll have a fair competition. Stefan slowly turned to face him. Martin stood at the entrance without approaching them. Fair competition? The man smiled mockingly. Fair competition with your mediocre capability? The superstar stared with distress at the lady caged in the man's arms, robbed of her power and will to fight for herself, and said, If you're just toying with her, then let her go. I don't trust that you can protect her and keep her safe. The man only arched his lips coldly. Ignoring him, he opened the door to the passenger seat and pushed the weak and helpless woman in. She sat, paralyzed in the car seat, without lifting her head. Skin on the side of her lower lip almost got torn from her brutal bites. Once he secured the seat belt on her torso, he got into the driver's seat without any expression. Flooring the accelerator, the Ford's car raced off into the distance with a thunderous roar. The superstar stared at the shadow of the departing car breathlessly, before his knees gave way, and he kneelingly dropped to the ground. So angry. If in the first place he had not given up his rights to be the head of the Lee household, then he at least would have the capability to fight with the man toe-to-toe -to -toe now. How can I lose to him? Stefan, damn it! James, who was hot on his heels, caught up to him just in time to see him collapse, and quickly ordered fearfully, Get the ambulance, quickly! Martin, Martin! Are you okay? The couple sped on the road without stopping, beating dozens of red lights in the process. Soon they were out of the city and on a long, winding suburban mountain. The man did not relent on the accelerator as his hands locked on the steering wheel. With her heart pounding and her breathing stifled, she focused on the accelerating tachometer. The car drifted at every bend with its incredible speed, and it nearly wrecked her nerves. Despite her best efforts to compose herself, she eventually still let out a shrill scream. 
She could even see sparks flying from the rearview mirror as the car boot scratched against the railing and produced a bit of spark. Without a doubt, any misjudgment from him and this car would go past the barrier and straight into the valley below. The man was on the verge of losing control over his emotions. Stefan, are you mad? Her scream was lost in the raging wind. Shut up. His handsome face was stiff as his frigid eyes stared straight ahead. The frighteningly chilly aura emanating from him constantly reminded her of the extent of his anger. The wind was howling and lashing against her face as they sped along the mountainous road. The strong gust of wind gripped her nostrils and gagged her throat, threatening to suffocate her. The speed was so fast that the steep cliffs outside the car seemed to flash by her eyes. The city neon lights were already a thousand of miles away. The speed limit signage flashed before their eyes and was soon left far behind. The valley below the road fence plunged deep and endless. If the car were to drop from here, both of them would definitely be crushed together with it. Is he gone mad? She turned to look at him with horrified eyes. The alarming speed he was driving had brought her to the end of her wits. 180 yards. 190 yards. My God, this is a mountain road. The 30 speed limit signage they constantly passed by reminded her of the perilous situation she was in now. Are you done? No. Go on with this. Are you worried about me? The man continued to stare forward without sparing her a glance. At a sharp bend straight ahead, he slammed the steering wheel. Episode 293, Do Not Touch Me Anymore. The man continued to stare forward without sparing her a glance. At a sharp bend straight ahead, he slammed the steering wheel and pulled the handbrake without warning. The heavy tires jammed hard against the ground with so much friction, a puff of smoke rose in the air. Following this, the burnt smell of rubber constricted her nostrils. When she saw puffs of white smoke rise from behind the car through the rearview mirror, her heart pounded loud and fast. Thinking of the car possibly catching on fire, she cried out fearfully, Are you worried about me? The man persisted with his question. Instead of stopping, he slammed the accelerator without reservation, and the car immediately doubled up its terrifying speed. Stop! You! Her stiff body had broken out into a cold sweat by now. After experiencing a few drifts around the bends, her face now had a worrying shade of white. Gripping the seatbelt across her for dear life, she closed her eyes tightly for fear of what she might see. Speak! Are you worried about me? His face was taut as he pressed her for an answer. He did another car drift, and this time, the friction of the tires emitted a loud shrill. The car continued to dash for the cliff and looked to fly into the valley below any time. You. She let out a scream at the top of her lungs. He pressed hard on the brake emotionlessly. The car slammed against the railing with the forceful braking and came to a heart-stopping halt just in time. The coupe sank and wobbled. Terrified, she opened her eyes to a view of a vast and deep mountainous range. From her periphery, half of the car's bonnet hung suspended in midair on the cliff's edge. Before them lay the bottomless valley. If he had not braked in time, the vehicle would have smashed through the barrier and flung into the valley below. What is this? Is he trying to scare me? His reckless driving, his scare tactic? Breathless and on the brink of a mental meltdown, she covered her ashen face with her hands. Stephen, I hate you! Monica covered her eyes in a desperate attempt to rein in her emotions so that the man would not see her most vulnerable self. He loosened his seatbelt and pulled her toward him with a stern order. I command you to take back your words. She looked at him unbelievably. Sometimes this man could be so heartless, he made one shiver. Monica, let me advise you. Don't antagonize me. He lowered his eyes on her fearful face, frostily ordering. Take back what you've just said. All right. I, I take it back, she stammered hoarsely. His icy glare fell on her soft, pinkish lips, which reminded him of a kissing scene he had witnessed earlier. 
His eyes narrowed dangerously. That scene was an eyesore that consumed him with rage. He had nowhere to vent. She struggled to take a gulp and carefully inched away from him. He reached out his arm and yanked her over to his side again. Pinching her chin with his hand, he stared icily and penetratingly at her face, his index finger rubbing her lip flops repeatedly. It was as if he were trying to erase something on them. Gradually, his blunt action caused her lips to bruise. Can you kiss here? Stunned, her lips trembled as she nodded slowly. He used his fingertips to rub the spot roughly, attempting to remove all traces of Martin on her lip. This action did not seem to be sufficient for him, though, as he suddenly leaned over and covered her mouth with his thin lip. His tongue hooked and suckled on her seriously and carefully. He then took another rough bite at her lips, asking, Why? He seemed to like him. She hurriedly shook her head. She had never entertained any ideas about Martin. The man gave her an eerie laugh before he aimed a bite at her lip corner. She retracted in pain, but was pulled even closer to him by his arm. Don't let him touch you again, then. Gloom exuded from him and from his every word. Her lashes flickered in fear as he continued frostily. You had better remember that you are my woman. I don't like anyone touching my woman. This is not allowed, even if it's for your job. I... I understand. There won't be a next time. Her voice was quaking. There won't be a next time, he barked another warning. He looked over his shoulder and put the car in reverse with a strong jerk. Her heart, which was hanging in suspension, seemed to return to safety on the road together with the car. Once the vehicle hit the safe zone, she quickly unbuckled her seatbelt, opened the car door to get out, and fell sitting on the ground. Her knees then propped her chest as her legs gave way. Her tummy had churned upside down with crazy speeding. It felt terrible. She clapped her chest to regurgitate, but she only felt gastric juice climb up to her throat each time. Along with the acidic juice in her throat, tears flooded her eyes without hesitation. She was in a really bad shape. The man pushed open the car door and walked out slowly. He turned to look at her and then walked over in her direction. She heard the footsteps behind her, and quickly flung up from the ground. Her eyes watched him guardingly as she backed away from him. The cold mountain wind ruffled and messed her hair. He stood before her with his long and lean body, his black shirt almost integrating with the darkness of the night. The foggy light from the coop was especially glaring. Against the lights of the car and the moonlight, the man's distinct silhouette cast a dense shadow on the ground. His icy eyes which were directed on her, shunned through his tousled fringe. Although it was still in June, the wind in the hinterland was cold and biting at night. Still, the wind was not as cold as the icy glint in his eyes. The hilly roads were barricaded, and except for them, no one else was allowed to enter. Here, he was the ruler. He walked over to her, bowed slightly, and tried to grip her wrist. Due to her subconscious fear, she abruptly avoided his action and flapped off his hand the moment his cool fingertips touched her skin. Snap. His hand was slapped to one side. It was as if her submission earlier was just an act to defuse his anger. Looking at the man's cold and menacing face, she kept retreating from him. Thoughts of his despicable behavior and gracious taunting flashed across her mind. Her heart hurt as her hatred for him intensified face changed instantly. What? Don't touch me. She put a distance between them, thinking of making a clean break with him once and for all. Pursing his lips tightly, he ignored her words and moved closer to her. Don't come near me. She backed a few more steps and broke down in distress, screaming, Don't you stupid. I want you. Episode 294, Let Me Go. His face turned ugly at her words, and malevolence glinted across his eyes. You want to say that again? It was a warning in disguise. This was to warn her not to antagonize him further. She slowly backed onto the guardrail 
when the neglected railing gave off a crunching sound. She watched his every move guardedly and said coolly, I don't want you to touch me. I'm pregnant with Stefan's child. He went to you before because he thought that I'm infertile. He's interested in you only because you have a unique connection to him. Now that I'm pregnant, do you think you can still usurp my position in the Lewis family? Are you trying to take advantage here? Oh. Dream on. If he's truly serious with you, why didn't he break off our engagement? Why did he bed me when he was just intimate with you? Now he got me pregnant. I am his future legal wife, while you're just passing secret fling. She clenched her fists tightly, as her eyes locked dead with despondency. The man glared at her again, his pretty eyes flaring red, and commanded icily, You don't want me to touch you. Monica, I'll give you one more chance. Take back your words and walk toward me. Infuriated by her continued backward shift, Stefan lambasted. If you don't want me to touch you, then who do you want to touch you? Martin? What has this got to do with Martin? She found him ridiculous. How dare you talk about him again? Stefan once more flared up uncontrollably when he heard her mention his name. He recalled how he had ordered the air ticket to fly back overnight from London and saw the two of them hugging and kissing in the production set. Although Stefan knew very well that it was only acting, he was still insanely jealous. Monica widened her eyes in disbelief. This man was really ridiculous. He was the one to mention Martin first. With bloodshot eyes, he uttered through clenched teeth, If you mention his name again, believe it or not, I'll make him disappear. Angry and alarmed, she said, I dare you. He stared sullenly at her. Seeing the way she defeated the man only made his blood boil faster. You just watch. The fury in his eyes shocked the woman. She spotted that his fist, which had been bleeding profusely due to the wooden splinters that punctured it when he had sent a punch through the blackboard, was now swollen and mangled. But he did not seem to feel the pain as he glared coldly at her like a predator looking at its prey. She unconsciously backed away again, and then she heard the guardrail behind her creaking precariously. These railings on this windingly hilly road were attacked by torrential rain and then exposed to the sweltering sun time and again. As the guardrail was already lacking in repair for some time, the cracking sound was soon heard from a hidden spot from the barrier. She did not notice that, though, as she was caught in a great panic. The man, meanwhile, was able to observe the danger behind her clearly. Terror flashed across his eyes as he howled. Stupid woman, are you seeking death? Come over here. She was scared by his furious roar and had shakily taken a few more steps backward, which sent loose rocks beneath her feet tumbling off a cliff. Crap. Shit. The man stared angrily at her. Don't move. Suddenly, realizing her perilous situation, she glanced behind her to check. What she saw was a bottomless pit below the cliff and heard was the cracking sound of the teetering guardrail she was slightly leaning her weight on. Her heart jumped instantly. She had acrophobia to begin with, so her legs quickly went soft from fear. The man fixed his eyes on her, afraid that any wrong move from her would result in her falling off a cliff with a dislodged railing. His heart went cold the moment he thought of that possibility. He was confident in his driving skills, so the car's speed earlier as it raced up this hilly road did not phase him. In contrast, right now, there was only panic in his mind. Chill coursed through his spine. This panic was something he had never felt before. He watched her nervously and reached out his hand to her. Come over. Don't back off anymore. She fell over. She would surely be smashed. She retorted quickly. Don't you come over. Unless you calm down, I won't go over. Eyeing her chillingly, he demanded, Stupid woman, are you threatening me? I'm not threatening you. You just work at yourself now. I'm afraid I'll be squashed by you first before I fall off the cliff. He angrily mumbled through clenched teeth. If I could, I'd wish to squash you now. Shaking, she sneered. I'd rather jump off this cliff than being squashed by you. How dare you? He howled furiously. She gnashed her teeth and replied, Do you watch? His fists were clenched so tightly that his knuckles turned white with cracking sounds. 
He struggled to keep himself under control for a while, and when he finally succeeded, with much difficulty, he said, All right, I'm calm now. He did that, despite knowing full well that she was threatening him. She watched the flaring flame finally recede from his eyes, biting her lower lip. She forced herself to calm down as well, before she negotiated with him peacefully. Stefan, you must agree to my one condition. What condition? He asked. His eyes never left her legs, or even their slightest action. He mentally calculated the distance between the two of them, in case of her falling off the cliff. Let's stop seeing each other. She clenched teeth as she fought the pain and misery welling up inside her. Let me go, will you? Let you go? He stifled a breath as his eyes grew sullen. What do you mean? Return my freedom to me, and I'll do the same for you. We don't interfere in each other's life. Isn't that better? She laughed bitterly. This is my condition. Let me go. His possessive, tyrannical, and controlling behavior were overwhelming and suffocating for her. Furthermore, he could not give her a sense of security. Perhaps a relationship was burdensome to begin with. It was something she did not want to bear anymore. He fixed his eyes on her and asked, What's the reason? No reason. I simply hate you. Looking calm, she said, I hate your arrogance, your dominance, your despotism, and your self-assertion even more. I haven't had peace of mind since I met you. Isn't all that enough reason? He only continued to stare at her with tumultuous, yet pensive eyes. He then spouted two words forcefully. I agree. His reply was so calm, it stabbed through her heart. She felt a sense of relief when she realized that she would get peace of mind once more. Episode 295. Since she wants, he will give her a home. Monica slowly straightened her body and walked towards Stefan. As soon as she reached midway, the man pounced on her by grabbing her wrist and roughly pulling her into his arms. His strength was reckless. She could see that his face was tautly fraught. He looked terrified for once. Is he worried about me? Is he worried that I would fall off the cliff? Before she could react... Both of them tumbled onto the coop's hood. She moaned softly from the pain. By the time she opened her eyes, he had already flipped over and pressed on top of her. His overarching body nearly obscured the moonlight. His handsome face, which was fuming and wry, loomed before her eyes. She was back in his reach again, and the anger he was suppressing could explode now to Sam's reservation. He furiously pinched her chin and buried his face in the crook of her neck, before he bit hard enough to penetrate her flesh. She felt numbness, which was followed by pain that spread to her forelimbs. She furrowed her brows when she heard the guttural sound of his sullen voice as he mouthed, Stop interfering in each other's life. Monica, who gave you the right to make this decision? Let me tell you that that is impossible. Amid her shock, she saw him lift his eyes to look at her. With his palm propping her nape, he forced her to look at his face. You'd better listen now. It's your business if you don't want me. But whether I want you or not, it's my business. You have no right to interfere. You! She was speechless with anger. I want you for good, he declared at her. Don't tell me that we belong to two different worlds. Monica, you listen carefully. I, Stephen Lewis, is your world. Understand? She wants me to let her go? That won't happen in this lifetime. At this moment, the hostility he felt was even worse than before. The strength he used to pinch her chin was so strong, it could crush her bone any time. Without giving her a chance to look away, he stared penetratingly into her eyes. Now it's your turn to answer my question. He probed coldly. Where has he touched you? She was startled. What? His gaze fell on her lip flap, and he rubbed it repeatedly with his fingertip. Besides here, where else did he touch you? Speak. 
This was when it dawned on her that he was talking about Martin. You don't let me touch you, but you let him touch you? What is he talking about? She flared up. He didn't touch me! I saw it. There's no use lying to me. He looked at her delicate lip, which had turned red and bloody as a result of his ravishing, and fury burned in his eyes again. He touched you here. That's work, all right? Don't use work as an excuse. Speak. Where else did he touch you? He held up a bunch of her sweet-smelling hair strands and questioned. Did he touch you here? She shook her head. Her startled eyes failed to conceal the terror she felt towards this man's near paranoid possessiveness. How about here? His fingertips brushed against her small waist. She continued to shake her head. Stefan, that's enough! Not enough. He reached his hand under her skirt hemline. His fingertips' cold touch sent shivers down her spine. Monica, do you know? Just the thought that his woman had been touched by another man sent him into a bout of insane jealousy. Indubitably, he was an arrogant man who did not allow anyone to touch his property. He definitely saw her as his property. That was the reason he gave Jane the ultimatum. Monica was never to have any physical contact with the opposite sex during the production, despite it being required by the job. He was not joking about this matter. Regarding that earlier trip to London, where he had to be outside the country for half a month due to a company acquisition, he did think of bringing her along. However, based on her temperament, he knew that she would not leave Andres alone to follow him. Thus, he did not speak to her about this. He did his utmost to respect her wishes. When he was away in the last ten days or so, besides busying himself with the acquisition affairs, he was thinking of her the whole time. He missed her like crazy. It felt like madness. All along, he was the high and haughty ruler that did not let himself compromise with anyone or to concede defeat to anyone. He also would not allow himself to be bound in any way. Alas, this time around, he failed. Who knew that a woman could actually make him miss her? This was simply incredible. He even wondered if she had cast a spell on him. If not, why would he only want her and no one else? He used to dismiss the notion of marriage. Was marriage the death of a relationship? He did not think so. Marriage, to him, was something dispensable. It was just a benefit tied to fame and fortune. The Lewis was an elite family that had no need for marriage to gain benefits or connections. Still, his marriage was not for him to decide in the first place. He had to marry whoever his grandfather took a fancy. It did not matter to him who his wife was. That piece of paper held no water to him. It seemed that she wanted a home, though. He carefully thought through this matter when he was in London. Since she longed for a stable family, he would give her a home. In this way, she needed not be dislocated or be defenseless. He neither cared for his liking nor her wanting. He just wanted to have his name, Stefan, etched in her life. He had always been an obstinate man from the very start up to now. It was either all or nothing. As for her, he wanted her for their entire lives. Once he set his eyes on a woman, no man or thing could wipe the idea off his mind. And what did she do instead? She blacklisted his number. Wondering about her situation, he took a straight flight back from London, only for him to bump into that scene in the production set. Saw her embracing and kissing another man, the kind of love and tenderness he himself was never a recipient of. From where he stood, he could see the unconcealed love and adoration on her face. His fury burned rapidly in that instant. Although he knew that the two were merely acting, he could not stop his raging jealousy. He wanted to tear Martin into pieces there and then. However, this woman tried to shield the man time and again. In fact, she had jumped to that superstar's defense by blocking his attack of her peril. Meanwhile, her attitude toward him was cold, unwilling, and guarded. She even told him not to touch her in mere hysteria. This is all good. He looked fixedly at her, cold gleam flashing across his eyes. She looked at him with a start. She could feel the heat of his intense fury, much like the heat emitting on her back from the sweltering engine hood. The poop speedily turned into Yunshan Shi.
Episode 296. You are squeamish about cleanliness, and I am too. Appearing emotionless, Stefan carried Monica into the villa. She tried to squirm him out of his arms, but he was not having any of it. His arms held her with such strength and steadiness. A punch from him could puncture a hole through a blackboard. From this alone, one could tell that he possessed quite the prowess. She lifted her gaze and was met with his arrogant jawline, which was taut and chilly. As he walked toward the master's bedroom, along the way, the maids astutely gave way for him in fright. They were experienced enough to read one's speech and behavior. When they noted that their young master's expression was not looking good, they gave him a wide berth for fear of incurring his wrath. He hoisted her into the bathroom in the master's bedroom and placed her in the bathtub. Her body then quickly sank in the warm water. Measuring a meter deep, three meters wide and five meters long, the bathtub's capacity was shockingly huge. She was dropped into the bathtub only moments ago, yet the water level had already reached the top of her head. As moisture seeped into her body, the lukewarm water flowed into her nostrils and the crevices between her lips and teeth. Caught by surprise, she choked on a mouthful of water. The man impassively watched her struggle for air before the bathtub as he sized her up from head to toe. She was still wearing her clothes on set. It was a student uniform, consisting of a clean white blouse and an aquamarine pleated shirt. All her clothes, which were now dripping wet, hugged her in all the right places, accentuating her dainty figure. Since her white blouse was soaked, the lingerie underneath could faintly be seen. Her impressive inner beauty was then exposed. Right now, she appeared to be in quite a discomposure. At a loss on what she should do, she stood there looking infuriated and embarrassed. Staring at him with raging humiliation, her eyes became shrouded in mist. His heart ached at the sight. Somehow he could not resist the urge to hug her. His handsome orbs scanned her entire body before they landed on her two collarbones, which seemed to be chiseled pieces of jade. As his vision caught hold of that milky white expanse and the smooth as jade pair of legs, his eyes burned with affection. However, as his mind rewound to that glaring scene, once he thought of her lips, wrist, and body having been touched by Martin, and once he considered other men having a share of her, he could not control his temper. His piercing gaze was akin to a sharp blade, which appeared to be about to penetrate through her body. He imparted her with some words. Clean yourself. Completely clean up where that man has touched you. Upon finishing his sentence, he slammed the door and made his way out. Watching him slam the door, she heard a loud thud from its immense impact that seemed capable of shaking the very foundation of this entire bathroom. That cold gaze of his just then had undoubtedly hurt her. Did he dislike her filth? Did he dislike that she had been touched by another? Nothing happened between her and Martin at all. He demanded her to clean herself, but what about him? Could he clean every inch of his body that had been touched by Gracia? He wanted her to be squeaky clean, right? Fine. She would grant his wish. Stefan headed toward the bar and popped a bottle of Lafite. He took a sip of it, and a rich aroma entered his mouth. He forced himself not to think about her, but he could not control his emotions. Clang. He smashed the glass onto the ground, as if this could help relieve his rage. Alas, despite this, the fury seemed to still be present. With a whoosh of his hand, the entire row of red wine on the table was swept to the ground. A total mess was made. A trembling maid astutely came to him and quickly freed the floor of any shard of glass. He rested on the sofa for a full hour, yet he did not see her exit the bathroom. A thought suddenly came to mind, and his heart suddenly thumped wildly. Abruptly springing up from the sofa, he dashed toward the bathroom. When he pushed the door ajar, he spotted her entire body submerged in the bathtub. It was hidden away by the soap bubbles and a thick layer of foam filling the bathtub from prying eyes. A wave of relief washed over him, followed by the tightening of his chin. He went over to her with a sullen face. Are you done cleaning yourself? She only concerned herself with tucking her head to her chest and furiously scrubbing her body. Her face looked apathetic. No one knew for how long she had been scrubbing her body, 
with the way she exerted all her strength into doing the task, made it seem as if she was hell-bent on exfoliating a layer of her skin. As for his question, she acted as if she did not hear it at all. This woman was clearly furious with him. Her heart had clearly gone cold toward him. He bent down with a solemn expression and brushed aside a layer of soap bubbles. His eyes then instantly contracted chillingly. Skin, which was originally flawless as white jade, was now raw. Nonetheless, she continued to rub and clean her skin as if she were numb to the pain. Some parts of her body, which were especially delicate, already had streaks of blood present, owing to her furious scrubbing. Damn it. What was she doing? What was she rubbing so hard for? Did she not feel pain? Her skin was extremely delicate. Normally, a lasting red mark would form with a light pinch from him. Even he could not bear to trample her skin. What exactly was she doing? Abusing herself? Was she using this to infuriate him? To get her revenge on him? His heart ached painfully. He stepped forward to her and moved to take away the towel in her hands at once. He flew into a rage. Are you crazy? She jerked away from him abruptly and turned to face him frostily as she tugged at her lips to form a distant arch. What wrong have I done this time? His brows creased as he watched her furiously toss the towel, which was soaked in soap bubbles, at him. The soap bubbles splashed into the air and spattered onto his taut and gloomy face. The eyes she used to look at him were now bloodshot. Didn't you want me to clean myself? What wrong have I done? I know that you detest my filthy body. I'm washing it. I'm washing it with all my might already. Get your fox straight. He clasped her wrist at once and reproved in a hushed voice. I never asked you to mistreat yourself like this. She chuckled sternly at him in response. I'm not mistreating myself. It's just that, how will I become clean if I don't wash myself like this? Each word she spouted increasingly induced his rage. He warned her not to infuriate him. What about him? Was his every word simply not frustrating, hurtful, or embarrassing to her? Those places in his body Gracia had touched that she found to be detestable, would he clean them too? She proceeded to lather some body wash onto her flesh. The bottle of liquid soap, which was previously filled to the brim, was now completely empty. Since he wanted her to wash herself clean, she would then make herself thick and span. Completely angered by her words, his brows came to a net. At this moment, he had to hold his temper in. He picked up the towel and attempted to help her wipe her body. However, she forcibly pushed him away in return. Don't touch me! His expression sank as his eyes were met with her fuming ones. Every look she cast on him was filled with contempt. Don't touch me! You dislike that I've become dirty from other people's touches, right? I, on the other hand, detest that you've become filthy from another woman's touch! She snatched back her towel from his hands at once and told him with derision, Please ensure that your body has been cleaned properly before touching me. You're squeamish about cleanliness, so why won't I be squeamish about it too? What do you mean? The mask over the fury on his face was now unveiled. Nothing! Episode 297 Have you said these words to Gracia as well? Monica's face looked equally ugly. She would do the same to him. With his long arms, he flipped her shoulders so that she would look at his frosty face. Speak. What do you mean by the words you've just said? There's no other meaning except that I find you dirty. She glared at him with frost. I'm not done yet, so please get out. Aren't you speaking? She continued to rub her body while she ignored his presence. He lost his patience finally. Gathering her in his arms, he drained the foam in the bathtub, turned on the shower head, and began to scrub her body. She pushed him away, and amid the struggle, he got drenched. He was not one to let her get away with her tantrum. So locking both her wrists with one arm, he pinned her down heavily inside the bathtub with the other. In this way, she totally lost her ability to fight him. The water in the tub soon overflowed, and it was refilled with fresh warm water. Knowing full well that she could not fight against him, she finally gave up her resistance and let the man patiently clean the foam off her body. He lowered his head 
and saw the stubborn and far-off look on her face. Her eyes were misty, while her ruddy lips were pursed into a thin line. He was rough at times when he cleaned her, but she did not utter a sound despite the pain. Forcibly suppressing herself, she was like a stubborn, wounded little beast. However, in all honesty, she needed to consider on whose territory she was in currently. Her apathy made him unhappy. Pinching her chin, he asked, Are you angry? Taking him as air, she clenched her lips tightly and refused to speak a word to him, no matter how many times he asked questions. Is she ignoring me? He sneered, wanting to see how long she could persist with his offensive. Her eyes were shut when she suddenly sensed a sensation from a certain area in her body. Her eyes opened with a start, and her body contracted involuntarily. He would not allow her to escape, and easily imprisoned her in his embrace. Her eyes flamed red as she glared at him with anger. He forced himself on top of her with one arm pinning her shoulders. She was nailed to the spot, unable to resist due to the difference between their physiques. She could only watch him remove his shirt with his other hand and pressed his hot and heavy body onto hers. His thin lips sealed her clenched lips. No matter how much she tried to avoid him, he had a way of overcoming her. The warm water continued to spray from the shower head, submerging both of them in the tub. Covering her lips with his, he recklessly laid her. She tried to resist initially, biting hard her lower lip to rebel against his efforts. Not even a muffled hum came out. He was out to torture her, though. Soon, she could not contain the surge climaxing within her as she let loose a mourn in the middle. Stephen! She broke down and called his name in a keening voice, making a last attempt of weak resistance. She reached out to push his shoulder, which he easily caught with one hand. Bowing his head low, he suckled on her fair and slender fingertips. Gradually, his action was no longer reckless and became gentle instead. Stefan carried Monica out of the bathroom. Spacious bedroom, where he was now standing, was his kingdom. It was a night of wild lovemaking. He could not recall when he had last touched her. All he could remember was that he had been missing her and suppressing his urge all this while. Drifting in and out of her consciousness, she could not remember how many times he had laid her. Stefan's tyranny was, once again, evident in their lovemaking. As he kissed Monica's brows, lips, and then her clavicle, he said, Over here. This is mine. Following this, the kisses traveled to her scapula, fingertip, waist, and abdomen. These are mine. He consumed her explosively as he declared, And here, you can only belong to me. It was as if he wanted to brand his name and presence on her physically. Monica, your every inch belongs to me. She broke down out of the blue. What about you, then? Do you belong to me? His action fell short upon hearing that, and looked quizzically at the teary-eyed woman lying below him. Does this belong to me? She brushed Stefan's lips. And does this belong to me? She touched his chest. Have you said those words to Gracia as well? Did you kiss and want her the way you kiss and want me? If I belong to you, then what about Gracia? Honestly, what made him think that only he could get jealous here? Was she not the same too? He was insanely jealous, and so was she. She was stuck in an unfair relationship with him now. On what grounds could he demand that she was to belong to him entirely? At dawn, Stefan went to take a shower in the bathroom. After he put on his bathrobe, he slowly walked and stood before the floor-to-ceiling window. Expressionlessly, he lit up a cigarette with a click of his lighter, and then a whiff of tobacco smell slowly permeated the air in the room. A wisp of smoke puffed and dispersed between his lips. From the window reflection, he could see the woman curling up into a fetal position in her sleep in the bed. He walked toward the bed and sat by its edge. Lowering his gaze onto her sleeping profile, he observed her incredible beauty. Her furrowed sweet brows and her messy raven hair complemented her fair skin. 
He did it with her several times. So now her face showed exhaustion, which pointed to his high vitality. He reached out, grasped a bunch of her hair in his hand, and sniffed its sweet fragrance. Taking a deep breath, he opened his eyes again as her words rang in his head. You say that I belong to you. Then do you belong to me? If I belong to you, then what about Gracia? Does she belong to you too? Do you belong to her? Based on his sharp intuition, he figured that something had happened while he was not around. Gracia? Could it be that she had said something to her? This was only a guess. Before he left the country, he specifically arranged a team of bodyguards to follow and protect her wherever she went. The report he received was that she had been filming at the production set all this time and had not come into contact with anyone else during his period of absence. When she woke up, it was already late in the afternoon. The curtains were tightly drawn across the windows, casting oppressive and nearly suffocating shadows over the bedroom. There was no one beside her in the bed. She held her dizzy and heavy head and sat up. Flipping away from the quilt, she saw that her body was now clean and dry with a bathrobe covering it. There was a stack of fresh and new clothes laid neatly next to the bed. Every item, from the lingerie to the overcoat, was according to her exact size. Episode 298 Andres may be unimpressed with a mere Lewis family. Monica heaved a long sigh of relief and tried to move her body with some difficulty. This was when she noticed the swelling around her inner thighs and close to her pelvis. Why is it so painful? She started to recall hazily their one tonight, and this made her face turn beet red. Frowning, she unfolded the quilt and tried to get out of the bed with her wobbling thighs. Her whole body ached terribly, and she could hardly hold herself up. Holding onto the side table for support, she took a deep breath to calm her pounding heart before she entered the bathroom to wash up. From the mirror in her periphery, she caught sight of a bright red mark on the side of her nape. She lifted her bathrobe neckline and shockingly discovered an interspersed of bruises and hickeys all over her body. That man had been aggressive in bed more than usual. Once she finished washing up, she put on a fresh set of clothes and stepped out of the bedroom. There was a row of servants waiting for her respectfully outside the door. Miss Thames, good morning. Their synchronized greeting startled her. Stunned for a moment, she proceeded to survey the area, and noted a line of politely smiling servants in uniforms standing next to the door. You are... She subconsciously straightened her collar and hastily put her hands behind her back to cover his hickeys as much as possible. Sir has left the house. Lunch has been prepared for you. At the dining table, she eyed the delectable spread before her without any appetite. She found the food to be tasteless, as she munched on it mechanically. The Lewis Residence When Stefan stepped into the house, he could see his grandfather sitting at his usual seat with his walking stick next to him. Gracia, who was beside the elderly man, was gently kneading his shoulders. Peter Lewis's face sank the moment he saw his grandson. His terrifying hawk-like eyes fixated on the young man angrily. The man's lips hooked into a smile, Grandpa. His grandfather, meanwhile, fumed. Knocking the cane against the floor several times, he lambasted, You still dare to regard me as your grandpa? The ferocious gust of violent anger blasted on the young chap's face. Standing at the doorway, a gleam zapped across his face when his periphery fell onto Gracia. His sharp gaze terrified her so much, her shoulders cowered timidly. The old man continued while he tried to keep his anger in check. I heard that you've been back to the country since last night, but you didn't come home. Where did you go? His gaze falling on the old man again, he said with much composure, Grandpa, 
I'm back here to announce something. You answer me first. It was apparent that the old man's anger had not subsided yet. Without waiting to hear another word from his grandson, he threw a magazine at him. He did not attempt to catch the flying object. The magazine hit the floor with its cover facing up. It was a picture the media had shot at Foxcom's annual gala. In this image, a splendid Monica was seen turning her head with a smile. It was just a side profile, but it captured all her stunning glamour. Who is this woman? He swept the picture with a cold glance, retracted his eyes, and then kept his silence. Gracia quickly leaned over and coaxed the old man. Grandpa, don't be angry. This is just a starlet from the show business. Is there a need for you to flare up over an ordinary actress? Gracia, I'm feeling sorry for you. Peter Lewis sighed and covered her hand with his wrinkled hand. What's so good about that woman? She's just an actress. As the saying goes, nothing good ever comes out from prostitutes and actresses. These actresses from the entertainment field are only looking at us for fame and fortune. This kind of woman won't be allowed into the Lewis family. Grandpa, don't make things difficult for him. In any case, he is never interested in me. I'm used to it by now. She put on a grieving face as she pretended to speak up for him, even though she was gloating inwardly. With Peter Lewis sticking up for me, what can Monica do? As long as this old man was around, Stefan would be unable to marry that woman into this household. Regarding this man, her heart had totally given up. His heart was never hers in the first place. She was nothing to him. Their engagement six years ago was a sham that he had unwillingly agreed on to please his grandfather. He delayed the wedding time and again simply because she did not matter to him. He had never touched her. A man avoiding touching a woman, not even her finger, just went to show that she had no place in his heart. It was not that she had not tried. She did her best to arouse him. Stripping herself bare in front of him, she only invited his disgusted look. He did not even spare her a glance. She was only Lewis in name, a mere title that she carried with her. Thus, the most important thing to her now was to make this title official by tying the knot with him as soon as possible. What if the man not loving her? She still had her fame and fortune, even though she could not capture his heart. This did not matter to her anymore. This was a sad thing about marrying an elite. The thought was actually a relief to her. The old man could not read her mind, of course. Mistaking her lonely countenance for forbearance, his heart went out to her. He turned to stare at the young man's face with fury and indignance. Stefan, look at what Gracia does for you despite how you treat her. Grandpa doesn't care if you're toying with that woman or not. As someone who's been through the same thing, I'll give you a piece of advice. There is no good apple in that acting industry. The actresses may look innocent, but all are in fact rotten to the core. I don't care for anything except that no one should replace Gracia as your official wife. The man smiled mockingly. Official? Peter Lewis did not catch the sarcasm that fleeted across the young man's eyes. At Gracia's cajoling, the old man had calmed down somewhat. If you like another woman, you can very well marry that girl as your second wife. I have no objection if that girl comes from a respectable family. But you tell me which woman from that entertainment field is not after our fame and fortune. I will never agree to have an actress marry into this household, not even as your mistress. After our fame and fortune? Does Monica need to go after our fame and fortune? The man even suspected her precious son of being unimpressed with a mere Lewis family. This was assuming that she was married. The boy, at the tender age of seven, already had a toy empire under his control. As the little lad had once told him, he was not as simple as he looked. The Lewis household might not even hold the boy's interest. Andres' arrogant demand echoed in his mind again. Stefan, let me tell you this. My mommy is a treasure to me. If you want to care for my mommy, you should be legitimate. The boy only wanted a legitimate title for his mother. That was all.
Episode 299. I want to cancel my engagement with her. As for Monica, she wanted a home. Thus, he would give them a home. Home for the four of them. Him, her, and the twins. Moreover, his youngest son was even more outstanding than him. With a fortune worth hundreds of millions at such a young age, he might be uninterested in the Lewis family in the first place. His thin lips parted to impart chilling words. Grandpa, I think you were mistaken. Peter Lewis could not get what he meant. His hawk-like eyes narrowed quizzically. What do you mean? Where am I mistaken? This woman, she will be my wife. The woman whom I have set my eyes on will be the future member of the Lewis family. What? The old man flared up instantly. Actually, more than anything else, he was bewildered by his declaration. Having watched over his grandson as he grew up, he knew him better than anyone else. Stefan was a fine gentleman from a young age with a strict upbringing. Unlike those young chaps from the filthy rich who spent their time merrymaking with countless gals clinging to them, his grandson was detached and aloof toward the opposite sex. He reckoned that his precious grandson was only toying around with that woman. who would not last. Once he got sick of that woman, he would quickly settle down. He truly did not expect his grandson to come home, telling him that he was serious. In fact, the chap was so serious about making that woman his wife, he even declared her to be the woman he had set his eyes on. How unbelievable! If that woman were from a well-fitting and wealthy family, he would accept that. However, an actress from the entertainment industry had no place in the Lewis family. His face turned livid. Looking coldly at his grandson, he ranted at the top of his lungs, Audacious! Are you not going to listen to me? I warned you that this kind of woman won't be permitted into the Lewis family. Have you taken my words to heart at all? Gracia cut in hastily. Grandpa, don't be angry. As you know, all women from the entertainment industry are calculative. They're cunning and can easily mesmerize a man like a vixen. Ah, uh, Stephen is just fooling around for now. If he really wants her, she can be his second wife. You don't mind? That only antagonized the old man even more. What do you mean by you don't mind? Gracia, I must chastise you. Why are you so magnanimous? That woman will fight with you for status if she marries our family. You're innocent as always. I can't bear to see you engage in a mind game with another woman, you know. I'm in pain, even if you're not. She smiled coyly and muttered, well, Stefan likes that woman, right? This can't be helped. Of course, I wish he can love me more, but feelings can't be forced. The young man's eyes narrowed dangerously as his gaze dropped onto her. She was born with a sweet mouth, spouting words sweeter than honey. She had the old man eating out of the palm of her hand. Expectedly, the latter's temper was completely appeased by her constant cajoling. It was no wonder Peter Lewis doted on her so much right down to the bone. She spent considerable efforts on this old man every day. In his old age, Peter Lewis no longer possessed a youthful vitality. Just like other old folk, he yearned for love and companionship. His grandson, who was often preoccupied with matters in the office, was hardly at home to keep him company. As for his great-grandson, Sam Lewis, was not affectionate to him for one reason or another. Thus, Gracia was the person who was always there for him woman had invested considerable time and energy in the old man. He arranged for her to become the director of the Human Resource Department at Make Wealth Financial Group and one of the four decision makers on the board of directors. In fact, she was considered the second in command in the Lewis Empire. Still, despite how busy her schedule was, she would make sure to finish her work early to keep the old man company at home. Peter Lewis was very reliant on her as well. Perhaps he missed Elizabeth Lewis terribly that he was subconsciously projecting his desires for her onto Gracia. What he had for her was a twisted form of attachment. Due to his failing health, the old man had several prescriptions to consume every day, and this distressed him greatly. On a bad day when his poor health bothered him, his short temper was explosive, and he refused to take his medications. 
only she could coax and cajole him into taking his medications in the end. He could not resist her sweet petulance, and she used that well to her advantage. Stefan looked ahead pensively, the aloof smile never leaving his face. The old man, who failed to see through her acts and take her magnanimity for real, exploded furiously. Liking! What does this chap know about liking someone? Can a marriage depend on love alone? Don't you worry, Gracia. As long as Grandpa is around, I won't let him bring this woman into this house. I support you all the way, and will make sure you are justly treated. She looked at him with a resigned smile and sighed. Uh, Grandpa, but... Grandpa, I'm back to announce something to you, too. Peter Lewis was in no mood to hear anything from the young man. What is it? The man slowly walked toward the couch and sat down. His body sank slightly onto the sofa seat as he maintained his cool and aloof persona. With his slender legs gracefully overlapping, he announced resolutely, I want to cancel my engagement with Gracia. What? The old man jumped in shock and disbelief at the news and screamed, What did you just say? My words are clear. I want to cancel my engagement with her. Stefan was unperturbed by his grandfather's angry outburst and just calmly reiterated his statement. I don't agree. Peter Lewis rejected without a second thought. His anger had reached the boiling point by now. I don't know what curse has gotten into you to consider breaking off the engagement. You're a bastard. His grandson only sniggered. Grandpa, since you like her so much, you can keep her as your mistress then. That only antagonized him further. Shut up! Good riddance! Stefan sneered at the remark. In the past, the argument would have stopped here. After all, he would never go against his grandfather's wishes. However, it was different today. The young man said in return, Grandpa, the truth is, forcing me to marry a woman I don't like is good riddance. Phew! This is absolutely unacceptable and disrespectful! The old man gawked at his grandson's audacity with a livid gaze. His eyes were nearly spurting razor-sharp daggers. You're unfilial indeed. You are going against my orders. Are you rebelling against me now? Episode 300. Peter Lewis's Morbid Obsession. This rascal is rebelling against me now. He no longer takes my wishes to heart. How dare he talk about breaking off the engagement? Peter Lewis held onto the table for support, his eyes shooting daggers at his grandson. The wedding was his personal wish, and nobody would be allowed to cancel it, not even his beloved grandson. The young man stared right into his grandfather's eyes expressionlessly. When he saw how defensive his grandfather was toward Gracia, and how furious he was at the thought of breaking off their engagement, Stefan was surer than ever on his suspicion over the attachment the elderly man had for that woman. It was not a simple case of elderly love for a young family relation, but rather a morbid obsession. Elizabeth Lewis The old man could not forget that woman, after all. Grandmaster Lewis missed his daughter so much, he carried her pendant with him all the time. Photos of her younger self lined his side table at the bed. Those were telltale signs of his attachment to her. The young man did not know what kind of woman Elizabeth was to make his father, and even his grandfather, pine for her in such a crazy way. Rumors had it that his father, Richard, was also madly in love with her. His grandfather had desperately courted this top songstress in the capital for quite some time, but his grandfather had coldly cut off his desires without mercy. The Missy from the wealthy Jung family in the capital was already betrothed to his father, and this marriage was critical to the Lewis family at that time. More importantly, his grandfather was old-fashioned and biased against all singers in general. He was thus irreconcilable to the idea of his son marrying a singer. His son had to compromise in the end, but with a condition, and that was for Peter Lewis to adopt Elizabeth. The old man agreed to that request. Thus, she officially became the adopted daughter of the Lewis family. At that time, plenty of elites coveted the woman, which was a testament to her beauty and talent. Peter Lewis was harsh on this woman at first and treated her badly. She, on the other hand, 
recognized the great favor and generosity of the Lewis family in her time of need. She was sincerely grateful to them, so she served him to the utmost of her ability. Gradually, he developed romantic feelings for her, too. He was truly delighted with the sweet and pretty woman, and soon became morbidly enamored with her. He would flare up whenever a man got close to her. Toward the end, he made a willful decision to make her his fourth wife. This shocked everyone, including her and the Lewis family. She only had gratitude and respect for him, and nothing more. He wanted to keep her by his side forever in a distorted way, however. Richard was the first one to voice his opinion. In the end, the father and son became enemies over this matter. This was when she confessed to Peter Lewis that she was seeing someone. She and the man were in love. In fact, she was pregnant with his child. The old man could not accept this reality. Livid, he ordered her to abort the child. She refused and left the family without a word. Since then, she was gone without a trace. Stefan eventually learned that the accident that had snuffed out Elizabeth's life was actually orchestrated by the Mafia. In fact, that was not the truth. He had unearthed something else in his investigation. Peter Lewis, who had gone to great lengths to find her after she had walked out of his life, even mobilized the army. He was hell-bent on tracing the whereabouts of his adopted daughter. His order was, I want to see Elizabeth alive, but kill off her children. They're bastards that must be eradicated. The Lewis family would not acknowledge illegitimate offsprings. She was trying to escape from his men when she met that fatal accident. There was an old belief. Beautiful women did not have long lives. As for her two children, they were lost without a trace. Their bodies could not even be found at the site of the accident. When the old man came to know of her untimely death, he was utterly heartbroken from devastation. Her death was a big blow to him, and he was sickly for the next five years. He was bedridden and often lost in a maudlin trance. The moment he recovered from all that, he realized that he could find her two kids to make amends for the loss of her. That led to Gracia being mistakenly adopted by him a decade and a half ago. He held a special delight for this girl and poured his love and attention onto her the way he wanted to do so for Elizabeth. His love for her was not that straightforward, though. When Stefan was still a young boy, he passed by the hall once and chanced upon the scene of Gracia taking a siesta on the couch and his grandfather sitting beside her with eyes condensed on her face. Occasionally, he would brush aside her out-of-place fringe and his wrinkly hand would caress her cheeks. It was as if he had caught a glimpse of Elizabeth and Gracia. The tender emotion on his face was accompanied by a twisted sense of love. Lowering his head, the old man kissed the young girl on the lip. Stefan knew deep down that his grandfather created this marriage arrangement because he was projecting his obsession and love sickness for Elizabeth onto Gracia. He was not particular about his marriage arrangement in the past. It was a mere formality to him that he needed to go through, so any woman would do for him. He had his thoughts and fixation now, however. He was adamant about breaking off this engagement. The young man refused to look at his grandfather's angry face as he slowly got off his seat. With his long and lean frame, he snorted smilingly. Grandpa, I don't care about what you think. I've made up my mind anyway. I'll find a date for a family meeting to make this announcement. How dare you! Peter Lewis hobbled on his walking stick and stood up. The wrinkled hand that held the cane shook as he stared furiously at his grandson. As long as I am around, your marriage arrangement remains valid. I will never agree to break off this engagement. I order you to take back your words now. The man only replied, I am unable to obey your order this time. Sorry. With that, he walked toward the stairs. Peter Lewis was enraged beyond words. This fellow was out to resist his will until the very end. For a woman from the entertainment circle, he actually dared to defy his order. In a moment of extreme anger and shock, he vehemently threw the walking cane in his hand at his grandson's back. There was a popping sound. The incense wooden cane landed heavily on Stefan's back. The man stopped in his tracks and slowly turned to face his grandfather. 
His eyes were full of disdain and chill. The alarmed Gracia saw the tense face off between the pair and hastily went up to support the angry old man who could not stop shaking. The old man pushed her aside and chased up to his grandson. Pointing at his nose, he berated, Unfilial! I tell you this! If you dare to cancel the engagement, you will lose your inheritance in the Lewis family! I hope you enjoyed the episodes. Thank you for listening. See you on the next episodes. Please don't forget to share, like, and subscribe.